Good evening, gentlemen. Welcome to the 2022 annual meeting for the Coleraine Township City of Cheviot Joint Economic Development District. Uh, it is 530 on Tuesday, November 15th, and we will begin with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and also a uh, moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's probably worth, um, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, taking the role for the group. So um, I will go ahead and do that. Um, Mr. Waller. Here. Mr. Tankersley. Here. And Mr. Voss. Here. Very good. The uh, first action item on our agenda is a motion to approve the minutes of the April 13, 2021 annual meeting. Those, mo those minutes are uh, in the board packet. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Mr. Voss moves. Mr. Wallert seconds. Uh, all in favor, please. Uh, Say so by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. There are no uh, citizens in the uh, audience this evening, so we can skip that portion <laughs> of the agenda. So, um, unless Mr. Unger, you would like to speak. Very well. Uh, and then finally, that uh, takes us to new business, um, one of which includes the um, swearing in of our newest member, Mr. Tankersley. Welcome. Thank you. Um, before we do that, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us about your role at Liberty Nursing? Sure. Yeah. Um, I started October 2020. Um, I'm the life safety director, so I deal with a lot of code compliance and stuff like that. So I got a background in maintenance uh, for 13 years in the healthcare industry and life safety for nine now so in my background great well, welcome aboard thank you thank for you. for uh, joining the board here so let's where are you in okay so if you could rise and raise your right hand and follow after me i'm mike tankersley Tankersley. Do you hereby solemnly swear that I shall support the Constitution of the United States of America? Do you hereby solemnly swear that I'll support the Constitution of the United States of America? And the Constitution of the State of Ohio? And the Constitution of the State of Ohio. And that I will faithfully, honestly, and impartially? That I will faithfully, honestly, and impartially? Discharge the duties of a board member? Discharge the duties of a board member? Of the Colerain Township City of Cheviot? Of the Colerain Township? City of Cheviot. Liberty Nursing Joint Economic Development District. Liberty, what was that? Liberty Nursing Joint Economic Development District. Liberty Nursing Joint Economic Development District, yes. District. For the term ending. For the term ending. December 31, 2027. December 31, 2027. Seven. Yes. To which I've been appointed. To which I've been appointed. So help me God. So help me God. Very good. Congratulations. Uh, the next item under new business is the review and approval of the quarterly financial statements. Those are also part of the board package, uh, board packet. Um, is there a motion to uh, approve those minutes or the those statements? So moved. I'll second. Mr. Boss moved. Mr. Waller seconds. Um, all in favor of approving those financial statements, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is uh, board member comments or discussion. Is, is there anything that any member of the board may want to uh, raise um, for the good of the JED? Nope. None. Very well. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second. Mr. Boss moves. Mr. Waller seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 
And we are adjourned at 535. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we have 6 p.m. Uh, Tuesday, November 15th from the rescheduled Board of Trustees um, meeting uh, from uh, the 8th. Uh, Mr. Baker, the attendance, please. Ms. Ulrich? Here. Mr. Unger? Here. Mr. Wallet? Here. Uh, Mr. Weckback, do we have reason to go to executive session? If so, under what exceptions under our revised code? Yes, uh, I would request a motion from the board to go into executive session in accordance with Ohio Revised Code Section 121.22G4 to discuss collective bargaining sessions and with 121.22G8 to consider confidential information relating to specific business strategy and to discuss negotiations with other political subdivisions respecting requests for economic development assistance. And uh, will there be any invited guests? Yes, there will be a Mr. Clippard that is invited. I motion that we go into executive sessions for the reasons detailed by Administrator Weckbach. I'll second. Any discussion? None. Nope. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wallet? Yes, that passes 3 0. We will enter executive session. And in the meantime, here at 6 01, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals will take our spot. So stay tuned. Thank you. Executive went a little bit longer. Um, uh, Mr. Baker, um, would you call attendance, please? Ms. Ulrich? Here. Mr. Unger? Here. Mr. Waller? Here. Um, is there anything to report from executive session, Mr. Weckback? Nothing to report. All right. Um, so we will go back in session here. It's 7.06. Uh, we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we just take a moment of silence to think about those intentions that we hold in our own hearts and for the folks of Corrin Township, Ohio, and the United States. Thank you. All right, you have been, the board has been provided with uh, minutes. <laughs> That's a Diet Coke. I know, but that was way noisier than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, sh I need to make an announcement uh, uh, for um, from Waycross right now because we're not on our normal day. If you're trying to watch us, we're not on the Coleraine page. I, I guess you can't see that. I don't know why I would make that announcement, but uh, we're live on Way Waycross live page, and that's where the sound can be heard. Um, I, I don't know what that means, but. Hopefully that answers some questions. So you have been provided in your uh, board packet the uh, minutes. Uh, are there any uh, are there any motions with regard to the minutes? Those were the October October twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I would motion that we approve the October twenty fifth minutes. I'll second. So we have motion and a second. Any discussion? I sent you maybe four um, edits on that, Mr. Baker. Okay. Uh, no other comments. All right, um, Mr. Baker. Ms. Orich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wallace? Yes, that passes 3-0 and those minutes are approved. We have um, in front of us um, a number of presentations. The first is by Chief Walls introducing and swearing in a newly promoted employee. Chief. Good evening to the board and those of you in attendance. So I'm here tonight to uh, introduce and swear in our newest full-time firefighter, Gavin Shannon. Gavin, would you come forward, please? Gavin's gonna be pinned tonight by his wife, Jessica. He's a graduate of the Colerain recruit class where he had his firefighter one, his EMT, and he's about to finish up firefighter two. Gavin has an associate's in physical therapy assisting from North Central State College and a bachelor's in exercise science from Ashland University. And I give uh, Gavin a heads up and let him know that he's going to do some public speaking tonight. So he's going to introduce his family and friends. Uh, I brought the whole gang. Um, <laughs> first row, my in-laws, Jill and James Brown, my brother-in-law and his wife, Sean and Julianne Brown. Taylor's holding my son, Carter. My nephew, Calvin. In the middle row is my mom, Mandy Ireland, my nephew, Jeremy Ireland, my wife, Jessica Brown. In the back row is my other brother, Justin Shannon. My other brother. And his wife, Jamie and Tara, and then his son. 
Thank you. At this time, would uh, Jessica come forward, please? Congratulations, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, what a great day for your for your big extended family that you've brought along now. Take them all out to, to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It never gets old seeing family members so happy. Congratulations. Um, do we do we want to? They're welcome to please yeah. stay for the meeting. You can stay for the meeting, or we're going to have a presentation run, on run. our. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for all coming. You hit me tongue tied because nobody's ever stayed. I'm like, wow. <laughs> All right, next up on the agenda, we have a presentation by Ned Heger Brim uh, on Grossbeck Branch of the Public Library. Is, is Brim, is that correct? Correct. Hey, how about that? Thank you, sir, for coming out this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Ned Heger Brim, and I'm the manager of the Grossbeck Branch of the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. We're down at Colerain and Galbraith. Um, I never remember whatever the things I want to say, so I'm going to read this. Please forgive me. Um, I asked for this time tonight so that I could publicly say thank you for some great work that was recently done over at the library in Grosbeck Park, and we're going to show you a photo here in a second. Um, Coleraine Township is, in fact, um, home to two of the largest branches in Hamilton County, the other being our North Central branch. And I am, of course, going to make a plug for my branch because that's how I like to do it. And we're located, as I said, right off of Coleraine and Galbraith, right next door to St. Anne's Church. Grosbeck is one of the heaviest used library branches in the county. Um, to date, in fact, in 2022, we've had more visitors to the branch than any other branch in Hamilton County. I think that's a real source of pride for the township. Um, if you have not been in recently, please stop by so we can count you toward a number one finish in 2022. Um, we do check out a lot of books at Grosbeck, um, like 15 to 20,000 books a month, which is really great. But we do a lot more than check out books. If you were to stop by, especially in the afternoon during the school year, um, you'd see a vital and vibrant uh, source of community connection for community members of all ages and backgrounds. In addition to offering engaging and enriching activities for all ages from babies to seniors, we provide year-round summer meals and school year snacks for free, after-school homework help for students, and are just generally bustling with activity. Um, some days that might be a flattering way to describe it. Um, Grosbeck computers are the most heavily used in the county as well. Um, by community members applying for jobs, submitting work and government documentation, doing job training and onboarding, supporting their small businesses through such activities as invoicing and creating marketing. Um, you truly can't do much in life anymore without a computer. And our computers and free Wi-Fi are a critical lifeline to people who don't have a computer at home and need to have something printed out. And it's really inspiring to see all of the business that goes on at the library. We do, by the way, offer free printing up to 20 pages a day, as well as free faxing and document scanning. And these services as well are used more at Grosbeck than any other branch in Hamilton County. Again, by community members submitting documentation for their jobs, their small businesses, tax 
insurance, Social Security, Job and Family Services, and many things more. Lastly, our branch got a makeover in 2020 as part of the library's extensive Building the Next Generation Library Project, and one of the improvements we added were small, three small meeting and study rooms to go along with our larger public meeting room. These are all free to use. I encourage you to take advantage of them, and the small rooms have been very heavily used by community members needing a close-off space for studying, tutoring, conducting business, attending virtual meetings, classes, events, you name it. I could go on and on, but I'll spare you that and just encourage everyone again to come by and use your Grosbeck branch. Make me proud. Um, we want to finish number one in 2022 or any one of our 41 locations you're eligible to use as an Ohio resident. The real reason I am here tonight is to say a very hearty word of thanks for some great work that was done over at the library in the park. You may know, you probably do, of Gail Nolte and Dale Beck and the work they do through side-by-side -side organization as well as Coleraine Hope which stands for Helping Our People Every Day. Gail and Dale, whom I would like to invite to come up here with me, if you'd be willing, deserve a lot of credit. Um, and I'm going to try to walk you through the photos there in a second. But they approached me with the idea of opening up and cleaning up the boundary between the library and the park for Coleraine Give Back Day. And the idea really took off and became something special. Um, Gail and Dale reached out to Jeff um, Weckback and Tawana Moulter. And they came through with great support from the township, which along with supporting work from the library and some great volunteers on Give Back Day, has made the area between these public facilities more usable, more attractive, and safer than I have ever imagined possible in my 20 years at the library. And I want to personally thank these four individuals for taking action, being so effective, and making a visible improvement to these community resources. And if you could, this is the top, is the before photo of our back park line. And here's what it looks like now. I think it's pretty stunning. Um, the kids are over there. They were over there before, but it was really not an ideal environment because the fence blocked off line of sight. There were things going over there that weren't always great. Um, and the kids are over there now like crazy. They feel safe using the park more. Um, people, the very day we did this, a family came by and said, can we go over there and use that playground? And we said, Absolutely, that's what this is for. But you can see it's you wouldn't know it. Um, that's me and a, a one of my staff members in the area sort of further to the west on the um, line. And it looks pretty overgrown. And look at it now. And you can see the um, picnic uh, shelter. Um, Tawana did a great job. Jeff really shepherded this through for us. And Gail and Dale just did remarkable work. And it just looks so much better. I was over at my library tonight um, with a group and around the room they just all commented on how much better it looks and I just think it's wonderful to see progress and to see improvement and to leave things better than you found them and I think this is a great example of it. So um, thank you Colerain Township trustees and administrators you gave a lot to this project and made it happen. Um, thank you Gail and Dale and Colerain Hope. Thank you for people working cooperatively and thank you, as always, to all the Coleraine Township residents who used the library, used the park, and helped out on this day for the support. I really, really appreciate it, and I think it turned out great. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. That looks thank great. You so much. Okay. Can I ask you, do you still have the Thursday morning preschool program there? We, um, we do. The one you're thinking of probably is the Movers and Shakers program. Mm -hmm. And that is now on Wednesday mornings. Okay. There's pretty much story time Monday through Thursday and then Thursday night. So we'll have something for you no matter what. But Wednesday night is um, a blast. Uh, a lot of fun, a lot of songs. Uh, so, yeah, come on down. Well, I've brought my toddlers there plenty of times. That's wonderful. Yes, it was Good a great program. Thank you. That's wonderful. Ned, uh, real quick, yep. what is the best way to find out information about events and different ongoings at the library? Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really our website, which is CHPL. Dot org. It's got everything on there. Um, obviously, our all of our social media, but you can link to the, on there. But the uh, website is the best way to find this stuff. Good. All the programs, all the different activities and things we're working on. Thank you, Jeff. And Gail, thank you for your long uh, time of providing service to this community. We've obviously known each other since way back when, when you were on the school board in the mid '90s. So it's, it's been quite a while. We'll give you a round of applause for that. And, and if I can add another uh, thank you to our parks crew that got down there and helped out with this project to really help it become a reality. Um, it should be no surprise they've got the equipment to make this job a little easier. And 
they knocked it out of the park. I think they were there with, you know, less than a day's work. They were able to do a lot of the, the clearing and the work that we needed to do. And that really helped to leverage all the folks that we had show up on Give Back Day at this site to then be able to branch out into the rest of the park and do a, a massive park cleanup that was needed. very needed. So a yes. uh, big shout out to Gail Dale, their whole crew, and then just the whole project has been just awesome, if you ask me. Fabulous. <clears throat> All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you again so much. Uh, now we have a presentation on the communication progress by communication specialist Tracy Norin. It's her first time. <laughs> We're excited. Good evening. Hello, uh, hello. So I'm Helen. Uh, for those of you who don't know, last name Tracy Norin. It's kind of confusing with the hyphen. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been the communication specialist for Coring Township for about seven months now. A um, little background on me. I came from Channel 9, TV background. Uh, I was the producer for the lifestyle show there for four and a half years. So I worked with Clyde Gray and I worked with a lot of members of the community before coming here to Coring Township. Um, so just wanted to do a, a quick presentation so over the, the seven months that I've been here, you can see by those tiny little numbers that our Facebook traction and our social media traction has really just skyrocketed. So um, social media is growing not only popularity in Coring Township, but just generally, right? So we are mostly on Facebook and Twitter because that is where the, bo the bulk of the population is at, but we also have accounts on Instagram and TikTok so that we can reach residents of all ages. Um, so that tiny little graph just shows in the seven short months that our page reach for the township is up 170% compared to the seven months before the communication specialist job was created. And it is, I mean, our average reach there is 171,000 people, which is incredible. Um, the shares and comments are up as well, which means Coleraine Township residents want to interact with these posts. They want to share them with their friends. They want other people to see them, which is wonderful. Um, and the same trend can be seen across the senior center, the police department, and the fire department as well. Um, So a lot of these, and I've put some animations on here. So. Um, the important thing is to create positive and continued coverage about Coleraine Township, right? It's easy to put negative stuff out there. It's much, it's much better for your mentality, really, to see positive, happy stories on social media. So you can see a couple of the ones that we've selected here. We have um, Officer Elston there who just came back from deployment. We've got our officer who took time to play football with the local kids, featured on Fox 19. Um, Captain Hopkins there with uh, fire department talking about EMS recruits and how the program is going. Of course, the goats in the park that everybody loves. Um, our team up, team up to Green Up initiative too in the bottom left there, uh, talking about how Coleraine Township is trying to just become a more sustainable green community. And of course, the firefighters with their um, International Ben Franklin Award for Valor that was recently presented too. And these are all just easy stories, but they weren't being told before. So I feel like that in my role is one of the important things to do is to tell all of these positive stories. They were happening before, but they just weren't getting out there. So communication. It's not just pretty pictures and words, it also builds trust with the community, right? It increases transparency with local government. So all of these things, we hear from the community about, hey, you know, we've got a street that needs repaving. We have this that happened in the park. We have, you know, a kudos. We wanna do a shout out for some of our parks people or an officer who took time to play football. That relationship with our government, I mean, it's, it's so important that we hear from people and that they know what we are doing about the events like our um, veteran dinner and dance that's coming up this week things of that nature it's very important to have that cycle go through um, that way it doesn't just put pretty pictures out there but it also builds that relationship and it ultimately helps coloring township become more fruitful 
Um, here's some examples of what we've done recently with business spotlights. Um, these are to better showcase the diversity in Coleraine Township. So we decided to focus on female owned and minority owned businesses. So the intensity dance studio there, um, the one who's being carried, she's a Coleraine Township native. She went to high school here. She grew up here and she chose to start her business here in Coleraine Township. I had no idea they were here until I talked to our, our zoning and development people and they're like, you're, you're going to want to talk to her. She's wonderful. Um, we've highlighted a lot of our Nepali grocery stores. We've got almost a dozen of them, I would say, at this point. And each one, everyone is just so proud when you walk in. They are so kind and they're just very, very welcoming. Richie's Chicken, another great example of a legacy business. Her father started the business in Louisville came up here to Cincinnati and now they are continuing the brand and they want to stay here in Coleraine Township, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. Each of these videos have garnered hundreds and hundreds of views and they've been shared dozens of times, which is great because in turn, this will make businesses want to come here to Coleraine Township and it gives those business owners that added value, that confidence that their local government believes in them to highlight them. So those are just a couple of the examples of the, uh, the continued communication we're doing here in Coleraine Township in the seven short months that I've been here. And I think you've been doing a terrific job and I'm so happy with your at the performance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, you Helen. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, th thank you, Helen. I'm glad to have gotten to know you over the last few months. I think you're doing a fine job. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've noticed too that the, um, the number of uh, views and tweets and retweets and Facebooks have just gone uh, through the roof, and that's that's good. I appreciate the work that you're doing, and I especially appreciate. Um, um, I think you give the media a little bit of push to recognize us on some things, and um, and, and and that's fantastic. So I appreciate that as well. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, I mean, I echo everything that you all are saying. And when you think about our ability to communicate, it, it's really about getting the message out in as many uh, platforms and forums as possible. And one of the areas where we weren't getting the message out a lot is through earned media. So news stories, uh, time on spotlights on actual live news. And Helen's been able to use her connections to make that happen, which has been really great for us because we've got fantastic stories up and down our entire organization. And so continuing to find you know, new ways to get that information out to show folks that you know, the, I think there's a common phrase in media that if it bleeds, it leads. Well, it doesn't have to be if it bleeds, it leads. We can look at all the positive that's going on as well. Um, and so appreciate all the efforts that you've done to date. And we, we expect more and bigger things to keep coming. So thank you, Helen. Great, thank you so much. Um, item D, we have a presentation of the 2023 budget book and strategic plan by finance director McElravey. Good evening, board. Good, Good evening. evening. So um, tonight is the first reading for the 2023 strategic plan and budget. Uh, we are not seeking any action from the board this evening. Uh, it's really um, uh, our goal here to um, hit on some of the highlights for um, that are in the strategic plan and budget and we are hoping that there will be a vote on uh, the strategic plan and budget uh, at your next meeting on December 13th. So, um, you as a board, I'm sure, are very familiar with our strategic goals for 2023, but for um, the benefit of those who have not, may not have uh, been as involved in the budget development process, uh, there are six uh, strategic goals um, that are part of uh, the 2023 budget. Uh, the first is to continue to focus on uh, providing high quality safety services. Uh, the second is to focus on beautification and litter and uh, dumping. Uh, the third is to continue to manage the township's finances responsibly. Uh, the fourth is to uh, continue to continuously improve the operations of the township. Uh, the fifth is to invest in our critical infrastructure, facilities, staff, and other assets. And uh, the sixth is to increase our focus on 
uh, economic development and township property. So, so for, for those of you that are in the audience, our projector, for whatever reason, every night at 7.30 seems to turn off on me. So I will get that up shortly, but please continue. You wanna, might want to turn it off and turn it back on again. That, that's exactly <laughs> that what I have to do every time. So, yep. so uh, taking the 40,000 foot view to really uh, look at the big picture, um, the forecasted revenue for the upcoming budget is uh, just shy of $40 million. It's $39,930,480. And the forecasted expenses are $48,608,447. And those of you who are quick with math will notice that there is, that those two numbers are not in line. Um, the reason is that we are utilizing existing fund balances uh, to meet some critical needs. Um, uh, the lion's share of that comes from a grant that we received from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that is just under 7.5 million of the difference between forecasted revenue and expenses. And then there are other um, uh, funds where we are spending down fund balance. Um, in the police fund, it is um, uh, just over 857,000 in fund balance that we're investing. In the sidewalk waiver program, uh, it's 250,000. For in the gas tax fund, it's just over 400,000. And in the general fund, it's uh, 317,000. So all of this um, is uh, projected to align uh, with our fund balance policy come the end of 2023, uh, with the exception of two funds, neither of which are a surprise. Um, the first is our police fund as we are uh, um, many years into a five-year levy, I believe we're in year 10, nine, uh, of a levy that was originally anticipated to uh, last for five years. And then also our road and bridge fund where um, it has been a priority of the board to um, accelerate the rate at which we are uh, resurfacing and rebuilding roads uh, throughout the township. So, um, that is the big picture. Moving uh, to um, each of the departments, we'll kick off with fire and EMS. Um, the staffing levels uh, for our fire and EMS service are unchanged with 90 full-time and 75 part-time staff. The um, two big things uh, that are new in this budget um, are uh, the replacement of stations 26 and 102. There's a number of items that are on your agenda this evening related to that. Um, and this budget also incorporates the new collective bargaining agreement uh, that we reached with the firefighters union. The initiatives uh, that uh, the fire and EMS service is going to be taking on this year are listed here. I'm now realizing that that's probably a little tough to read. Um, but I will hit on a few highlights. Um, they are going to be exploring the viability of um, uh, providing uh, community paramedicine. Uh, the fire and EMS service is also going to be seeking a new uh, uh, form of accreditation. And of course, we talked about the two new fire stations and um, they're also going to be working uh, on uh, retention efforts. Uh, we invest a tremendous amount of time and money uh, training these folks and we want to make sure that we keep them around for as long as possible. As for the budget itself, the uh, vast majority of our expense in the fire and EMS funds um, are for our people. This is a 24-7 service um, and between salaries and benefits uh, that takes up just about 73% of the budget overall. Um, and then you can see the other categories as they shake out. Um, it's probably um, worth noting that the salary lines that, um, that you're going to see through a number of these funds are uh, lower than they have been historically. And that is because um, what this budget contemplates is using the um, American Rescue Plan funds to offset salary costs and through the revenue replacement uh, category in, uh, in the American Rescue Plan. And what that will do is allow the funds that we raise as a township uh, to be available for our other priorities um, and um, um, be able to accomplish a heck of a lot more than we would have been able to absent uh, those funds. Moving on to 
the police department, um, this budget fully funds the impact unit by adding uh, six officers to the complement. Um, one of the um, priorities, one of the strategic initiatives that they're going to take on this year uh, with code enforcement folks is a code enforcement blitz in Northbrook. Um, and the budget also provides funds to relocate and expand the impound lot. Um, the existing location is a facility that is in really rough shape and uh, it often um, uh, is uh, up to its capacity as well. So relocating uh, and expanding the lot will allow us to um, better serve the public, better operate uh, the impound function, and also um, uh, um, raise a little more money. So uh, the initiatives for the police department, I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, but I'll just hit on a few highlights. Um, there's a real commitment to increasing the uh, training for our officers. Um, I mentioned the code enforcement blitz in Northbrook. Um, uh, under the fifth priority, um, a couple of their initiatives are to um, uh, implement traffic incident mapping software, which will help us to better understand where we are having chronic issues and, and bring remedies to bear uh, on those areas. Um, also improvements to the property room, and I mentioned the uh, impound lot. For the budget itself, it's a similar situation uh, with fire. It's a 24-7 operation, and the, the number one expense by far is our people. Um, um, so you can see how the other pieces come together. And um, anyone who's interested in diving in a little deeper on just what makes up each of these pieces to the pie, I, I would encourage you to uh, go to our website, chlorine.org, uh, and go to the uh, transparency tab, um, and that will take you to uh, where we have this budget, and you can click on all of the wedges and get down into as much detail as, as, you, uh, as, as you would like. For public services, they have a busy year ahead. Um, probably the, the biggest thing, uh, again, is a function of the American Rescue Plan. Um, this budget increases the roads program by $2 million. Uh, it also, uh, they were able to secure a $400,000 grant uh, to implement the tot lot, the third phase of Fort Coleraine. Uh, it uh, continues the street tree program. Um, they are also going to be working on sidewalk projects that are moving from the planning and funding stage to the operation phase. So that's uh, on Coleraine, Shady Crest to John Rose, uh, on Pippin, Stout to Lake Gloria, and uh, on Springdale from Coleraine to Laura Linda. And this, uh, finally, this uh, budget incorporates the new collective of bargaining agreement that is on your agenda this evening with uh, ASME, with our public services folks. In terms of their initiatives, I'll just highlight a few. Um, under the uh, second um, goal. Uh, they're going to be working on the 275 gateway um, and also beautification in Clipper Park. And under the fifth initiative, um, they're looking at uh, the viability of um, putting together a couple of dog parks. Um, they're also going to be working on uh, another roads project uh, application through the state's SKIP program. Um, uh, we mentioned Fort, Col Fort Coleraine and also the street trees. So busy year for the folks in public services. So um, the biggest change that you would see from prior years uh, in the public services budget is that the biggest category is purchase services rather than uh, salaries and benefits. And again, that is a function of the American Rescue Plan and those salaries being shifted out of the various parks uh, and roads and community center funds uh, into, um, into the American Rescue Plan. On to the development department. So a number of things that have been in the works uh, in 2022 are going to go into implementation in 2023. Um, were, uh, it's a major initiative to update the zoning re resolution, and I think that kind of understates the magnitude of the undertaking. I mean, basically, they are rewriting the zoning code for the township. Um, 
a couple of things that have been discussed in recent meetings. They'll be implementing the rental registration program, uh, should the board decide to move forward with that. Uh, they'll be implementing the uh, commercial facade improvement program. Um, and they have been tasked with our uh, sidewalks efforts to be the ones that seek out the grant funding that is so important for us to be able to continue to do that work and scale that up. Um, there's uh, funding in the budget for some targeted demolitions and they will continue with their business retention program. Uh, just a couple of initiatives to, to highlight here. We talked about the sidewalk engineering and grant uh, 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 pursuit work, application work, um, and uh, also the zoning update. So I guess we've already touched on those. Uh, from a budget standpoint, So, so their budget is similar to others in 2023 as we were looking for ways in order to move dollars around to meet the needs of the American Rescue Plan and the directives that you all set in order to be able to fit $2 million for the road program. These salaries have shifted out into the ARPA funds, which then frees up dollars that would have been a general fund transfer to allow us to put those monies toward our $2 million for roadway improvements. So the budget looks funny um, because there are no salaries in that line. Uh, but that that's sort of the shell game that we've got to use to get the dollars where we need them. Call it a shell game. I would just that's, that's fair. So of the 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 seven point nine is it seven point nine million? Seven point five million. Seven point five million. Yes. Um, the two was for roads in his. Yep. The other five point five. It's been contemplated in this budget in terms of two million dollars toward the fire department, which would go toward. Uh, replacement of likely an engine as well as uh, any startup costs that we might need for the community paramedicine program and then the other dollars are, have been set aside and allocated for the police department to fully fund our impact unit to offset um, you know potential ongoing issues in that department from a financial standpoint um, and then to just in, you know improve our, our overall fund balance picture for that department Okay, so that's the entire entirety of that seven and eight. That's that's the allocation at this point as proposed in this budget. All right. Um, why have why I've interrupted? I have another question that from way back in the beginning, when you said the general fund would kick in a three hundred and seventeen and some change fund balance, is that assumed leftovers from from this year, or is that the general fund? So what we're looking at in that instance is what the fund balance was at the end of 22 and what the fund balance is projected to be at the end of 23. And the difference between the two is that is that number. Okay, and, the and, last and time we talked, I noticed that the, we there were some funds that we weren't going to spend. Yeah, so in the, the general fund in particular, we've kind of got a unique year in that we've got two major projects that were half funded by outside entities. Those two projects being the uh, the bus pull-offs that were half funded by SORTA. That's about a half million dollar project, so that's about 250 that's coming out of the general fund. And then the other project is the Coleraine Avenue sidewalk project from John Rose's Shady Crest. I believe that project is roughly 1.3 to $1.5 million, and so half of that is coming out of township funds. And so that roughly million dollars that's going to one-time capital projects is what's leading toward a one-time drawdown of reserve in 2023 from the general fund. So we anticipate the general fund not spending how much of this year's budget? A million and a half, you're saying, is that? Oh, this year's budget? Um, I'm not sure. I know year to date, we've collected over 100% of our revenues for the year, and we've spent about 70% of our expenses for the year. Now that's across all funds. Um, if we would like, I could get, dig into those numbers here in a moment, and we could see exactly where we're at in the general fund. But, but is that included in the number that you gave us, the, the general fund fund balance, 317000 or is that? It is not. Okay. So the numbers that we use when we build out the long-range forecast is we just use budget numbers for both revenues and expenses for 2022. We recognize that actuals are going to be lower on the expense size, and revenues are going to be higher on the revenue side which is gonna to lead to numbers that are better for our fund balances long-term, but in order to say conservative, we just stick with the what we consider to be the most conservative numbers. All right, so I'd like to see an estimate of what which part of this year's budget uh, we're not gonna spend uh, based upon what the fund balances are now. And I know a couple of them that were, when we went through, uh, balance by balance, that 
that there were some that were capital improvements that were 50, like one was 55,000, I think, the one I'm thinking of specifically. And at this point, uh, November 15th, we're clearly not gonna spend that. Uh, and, and my question is when I heard for 317, the numbers I went through, when I looked at the items that we haven't spent and I anticipate we won't spend, seemed a lot higher than 317. Sure. And I'm, I'm just, so I'm trying to get an idea where we're at on that. Yep. Okay. It, it, um, one of the exercises that we went through um, as part of the budget process is to see where our fund balances projected to be at the end of 23 um, will be compared to the set of financial policies that the board passed recently about fund balances. Um, and for the general fund, the policy is that the fund balance should be at least 100% of prior year expenses and we are uh, well above that. The anticipated fund balance for the end of 23 is just shy of $7 million. Now to Mr. Weckbach's point, that's, you know, those, those are budget numbers and as the actuals come in for 22, that's only gonna get better. Okay, well, and again, well, I have you interrupted and then I'll let you go um, and continue, I'm, I apologize. But this is the other thing we talked about. If we figured out a mechanism yet to account for and remove from the universe of costs uh, over time for police and fire. A separate budgeted item yes i think what he's suggesting is is our accounting system now able to allocate overtime separately from the salaries line at the line item level i do not believe so okay so i i guess my charge to you guys is you're the finance guys um figure it out somehow i want to be able to look at a number that says this is what we spend on overtime police and this is what we spent overtime fire um and i don't know how that how we get there um, but I, I got to think that there's a way that, that we can either do that or, I, I mean, it, it, if we can't even do that, maybe hours with, with an estimate on what we pay, average hours or something. So, but, but I want to have a number that I can look back at and say, all right, this is what we're spending on overtime. So we do have a report that's updated every month that shows the total number of hours of overtime worked by department. So that does currently exist on our website. Um, backing into an, an average cost is certainly something that that won't be too you know onerous for us to do because we could certainly figure out just based off of CBAs what those those average numbers are okay I want to put I want to put a number to that um, uh, the, the more accurate the better but all right I'm sorry go ahead not a problem so uh, I think that takes us to uh, the administration portion of the budget. And we've touched on a lot of this uh, already in each of the operating departments. But you know, for budgeting purposes, um, a lot of this stuff comes out of the general fund, which is managed by administration. So that's some of the sidewalks and road programs and some of the operating support for parks and the community center. Some things that are happening um, uh, in the uh, general fund um, that are worth mentioning is uh, that we're going to be continuing to do facility maintenance on the campus here, including um, some work with the elevator and the air handling systems. Um, and uh, uh, we are also going to be implementing scheduling and timekeeping software uh, across the organization. We expect that to kick in in the first quarter of 2023. And um, perhaps coming out of that, we will be able to better answer your question regarding overtime spend. Next slide is the uh, initiatives for the administration. Um, uh, I think probably for the sake of time, I'll l allow everybody to take a look at this uh, on their own. Um, and then also with the budget again, this is moving um, a substantial amount of um, salary out of the general fund to allow for uh, the um, priorities that Mr. Wackbach described a moment ago. And then finally, um, like to take a moment to talk about the capital budget because the capital budget for 2023 is a big one um, particularly compared to uh, historic um, our you know, historic uh, budget numbers so um, some of the larger um, uh, items that are in the capital budget are for the road, pro road program so this is the 1.9 that we usually do with the additional 2 million uh, through the american rescue plan um, it, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 2023 also has uh, the first half of the expenses for the replacements of station 102 and 26 uh, with the second half of those expenses being scheduled for 2024 
Uh, and then finally, worth pointing out, the $400,000 grant that we received for uh, the third phase of Fort, Fort Coleraine. So with all of that together, in, in addition to the 1.625 that we have to, uh, for the Coleraine side, sidewalk project that we have to front before we're reimbursed uh, out for, uh, uh, for that, um, that leads to a capital budget number that is just over $12.5 million. You'll also notice that that number quickly ticks down in, in the out years of the capital plan. So thematically, in past years, we, we've tend to bookend our budget with a, an expression, a sort of summary of what we're trying to do. This year it was clean, green, prosperous, and safe. And really when I was spending a lot of time thinking about the budget and looking at this chart in particular, so when you look at the capital spend that's contemplated over 2023 and 2024, uh, my mind immediately went to investing in our future today. So thematically, that, that is sort of how I've characterized this budget because we are making some large investments in our community that are going to stand and be around for 20 to 50 plus years. And I'm excited about these invest investments that we're going to be making because you're going to see a lot of shovels in the ground and you know, you tend to see development projects that follow these types of investments shortly thereafter, because when you've made these improvements to your community and you've shown that commitment to making a better overall landscape, that creates a more attractive environment for businesses and residents to want to be here and to want to invest their dollars as well. So you may hear me over the next few years, like you used to hear others say uh, what the theme is and investing in our future today is really what I, I think this budget is setting us up to do. Thank you. Any uh, additional questions? No, I just think your team has done a phenomenal job of getting all this information to us, and I thank you very hard, much for all your hard work with your whole team. Our pleasure. It's, it, it was definitely a team effort. Mr. Weckbach yes. was uh, um, <laughs> deep, deep, deep in this, and, and uh, yes. the, the whole leadership team as well. Thank you for your efforts. So I will follow up with questions. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we have... Um, uh, uh, Police Lieutenant uh, Dorfline with a presentation on active shooter training. And as Dean comes to the, the podium here, um, I'm not sure which trustee it was, but I know one of you had expressed to us that they would like to learn more about what would we do if there was an active shooter situation at one of these meetings. Now, I preface this by saying Dean can't share all the ins and outs of what you would do because then if the active shooter were, say, watching this meeting, they would know exactly what to do to counter that. But uh, with that brief intro, I will turn it over to, to Dean, who will hopefully walk us through some very important topics. Good evening, Gordon. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, give you a little bit of background. I am sorry. We need to turn the mic on. Sorry. Um, give you a little bit of background about myself. I spent eight years with the school district um, in teaching the 10,000 students and staff throughout the district, the Alice program. Um, it is a power-based decision-making in the active shooter, um, and it's an acronym. Uh, this video that we're going to show um, will run you through the acronym, and then we will talk about there a little bit after. Um, we do have some individuals in the crowd through our uh, Citizens Police Academy. I teach a situational awareness, which ties into active shooter type stuff in the public. Um, so they can bear with me. They've seen this video, um, but we'll go through this video. I will preempt this with um, there are gunfire. There's no um, gory video. This is filmed on Kansas uh, University um, campus with students there, and it will run you through the complete ALICE acronym. And then I'll come back up and we can discuss further points. Just stay in the line with me. We need to know what's going on. Okay. Okay. I am on the floor. Okay. And you've okay. got the kids there. And I've got every student in this library on the floor. You better stay on the floor. Is there any way you can lock the doors? Um, smoke is coming in from out there and I'm a little okay. afraid. The gun is right outside the library door. Okay. I don't think I'm going to go out there. Okay. okay. You are calling my high school. I got, I got three children. Okay. We got it. Okay. Thank you. 
said there's a shooting in Nichols Hall. <laughs> Can you actively hear gunshots? Uh, he was downstairs in the lobby. Somebody's, he shot somebody. Um, Can you describe what the shooter looks like? White male. Uh, he had a big coat, uh, black or blue. Uh, uh, he had facial hair. Uh, I don't know what way he went. White male, okay. I ran upstairs. Uh, we're in the classroom right now. We have an instructor with us. We barricaded the door. Okay, can you stay on the line while I get officers en route? Yeah. State Hall units, can I have you en route to Nichols Hall for shots fired? Suspect is description is a white male with facial hair, black jacket, black pants. Last known location was in the lobby. Repeat, Nichols Hall for shots fired. Okay, and what is your current location? Upstairs in 301. I'm going to ask that you stay on the line with me. I have officers en route me and continue to barricade your space and be prepared to defend yourself if necessary. What you have just seen is a proactive approach to survival in a violent intruder situation. Traditional response to violent intruder events has focused primarily on lockdown only principles. Analysis of past events has taught us that survival may depend on utilizing several options to include but not limited to lockdown. Under stress, we default to our level of training. We must train our brains to react to various crisis events, allowing us to respond proactively and increasing our chances for survival. The shooter has a plan, you should too. This training will aid you in developing that plan. Alice is a concept which allows those who find themselves in deadly situations the opportunity to make informed decisions about how they respond to that event given the available information. Alice is an acronym to help you remember what to do. Your response may or may not occur in the order listed and all options might not be necessary for every event. Keep in mind, each person or group will respond differently given their proximity to the crisis and responses may change during the duration of the event. Alert. If you are in a safe place, use any means available to alert the police. Stay on the line if at all possible. Give clear and accurate information about the location, suspect, weapons, and injuries. Alert others of the danger if possible, again using any means available to you. Lockdown. Lockdown is still an integral aspect of active shooter response. If you are in an area that can be secured, do so. Lock the door if possible and use other means to barricade and secure the door. Stay clear of windows and silence phones. Even if the door is secured and barricaded, make a plan on how you will respond if the shooter makes entry into your area and be ready to attack if necessary. Inform. Continue to share information with the police those around you, and others throughout the entirety of the event. Information is fluid, and your response must be as well. Counter. If you come in contact with the shooter and you cannot escape, make yourself a hard target. Move, react, throw objects. Do not become static and passive. Improvise defense. Use anything and everything to distract or disable the shooter. If possible, employ multiple people to swarm, secure, and disarm the attacker. Put the weapon in a trash can or out of sight. When the police arrive, they do not want to misidentify who the shooter is. Remember, if you encounter a shooter, it will be a fight for survival. Don't hesitate. Most active shooters are not expecting resistance. Evacuate. If there is any safe way out of the room and building, use it to escape. The goal in any crisis situation is to remove yourself from it and create as much distance as possible. Know your surroundings, exits, escape points. 
Don't use your car to evacuate. You do not want to cause traffic jams that prevent police from getting to the site. The most important message to remember is do something. Your goal is to survive by any means necessary. Train your brain and be proactive about your survival. While it is school based, it is something that the general public can use as uh, information in shopping malls, grocery stores, so on and so forth. And then these chambers, you guys can use this uh, during your meetings as well, knowing your exit points, knowing what you can and cannot do. Um, the biggest thing is with the counter. You're going to interrupt is what we call law enforcement during the loop. So if somebody comes in to cause anybody in harm in these chambers, throwing something at them or coming in with a purpose to cause physical harm and death to individuals, and that's all they're focused on. Um, and if you pick up your um, tablets or um, signs or anything you're throwing at them, you're breaking their OODA loop and it's diverting their attention. They then have to re-establish their thought process, come back up on target to continue with what their purpose was coming in the chambers. Um, so breaking their OODA loop and having them distracted by whatever's going on, getting up running, throwing things at them, whether it's chairs in the audience, um, and then knowing the exit points and knowing your layout in which uh, these chambers are laid for you to make the best decision possible and keep yourself safe. Can I, um, <clears throat> for the public, we've had three active shooter, I guess, call-ins that were false in the last couple months, one being Pleasant Run, one being Cincinnati Public, and the other one was Princeton. And I got to see um, the one call at Princeton on Colerain Avenue, the amount of police undercover that were facilitated to that school. Sure. Um, we just found um, who the false call in in Colerain Township. Um, are we making any public address to how much we're going to pursue to the full extent of the law with these people doing this? During that investigation, um, I was actually on scene there. We worked cooperatively with federal agencies and also the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office. Um, and they are fully aware of what the criminal charges are and the extent to which the community was um, in disarray over that event. Um, but anything that we've done, we have uh, worked through the Prosecutor's Office to uh, criminally prosecute those types of scenarios. And the one was actually a call out of India or Russia? Ethiopia. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So a lot of these uh, active shooter calls that are happening across the U.S. are actually coming from out of the United States, and that's creating a, a traditional, or not a traditional, but a, an extreme strain on our resources. And there's actually been way more than three. Um, I'm just talking about yeah. our local area right now. Well, in, in Cincinnati, there were three. Oh, just this. Two I just days said, ago. Oh, I just said in the last couple yeah. months. It's been unbelievable yeah. how many of these have, are happening. Yeah, and it's not going to slow down in society. Um, unfortunately, to kind of give you guys more power based on Alice, um, what we talk about in law enforcement is cover versus concealment. Um, concealment is something that um, hides your location. So basically dropping down and hiding, flipping a table, hiding behind the, a table is concealment to being behind a center block wall um, for cover. It adds that ballistic value to it, so it will stop a round coming out of a firearm. Um, so cover versus concealment and what you're hiding behind or what you're, you're taking cover behind. Um, just know the value of what that substance is, is that you're, what you're taking cover behind. Um, and then in preparation, you know, um, obviously you three sit up at the front um, where everybody sees you, but knowing the layout and who's in the crowd and where your exits are, um, stuff like that is what's going to ultimately, everything is going to go this way. This is the way everybody comes into the chambers um, and there's stuff beyond that wall behind you guys there too. Um, so just knowing what's behind, behind there and beyond there and what your capabilities are beyond that wall as versus as we were talking before the meeting, um, the people in, in the crowd wanted to know what they should do. I said, well, you're sitting near three exit points. Something happens, get out one of those exit points as soon as you possibly can. Um, calling 911, you would think it would be something very simple. Um, we're in the same building as the police department, but I will tell you we have continuously received valuable information over a 911 line. Um, where you don't say anything. You can say, you know, uh, Lieutenant Dorfline, I'm in a closet, wherever, um, and 
the call at the beginning of the video was actually a live call from Columbine High School in 1999-2000 um, out of the library, and that was the library, and she's a substitute librarian. Um, she had 54 students in that library. Um, there is a uh, scale, a map of the library. She had 54 students, and she was probably 200 feet away from an exit, um, and she told all the kids to hide under tables and take cover under tables as there was shootings going on outside the library where she would have taken a deep breath and realized her surroundings. She could possibly have led some kids to safety that day. Um, so knowing your surroundings and knowing what's around you and what your capabilities are as an individual is the most powerful thing that you guys can have. Um, where do you go when all this is going on? Um, obviously, I don't encourage anybody to stay in what we call the hot zone. Um, this building would be completely um, surrounded by law enforcement and uh, to get to somewhere where you feel safe and call 911 and let us know where you are and then we would come pick you up and reunite you and get everybody back together for uh, making sure that we have everybody accounted for that was in the meeting and so forth. Is there any questions or I know this is a lot it's a heavy subject I know it's I try not to be a Debbie Downer but this is a realistic part of our society unfortunately um, and it's better to be prepared um, I live in a when this happens, not if this happens, because you're one step closer to being prepared if you live in the when state, not an if. So the, the UDA, I'm trying to think, UDA, observe, orient, yep. decide. So, um, I have a whole circle here. It is the uh, observation, orientation, decision, and the action. Okay. Uh, I know that in schools, one thing that we've gone to, because the statistics show that most, most um, most uh, injuries are going to happen in the first three or four minutes um, that we have medical kit, not even medical kits, but you know, things that have like tourniquets and stuff like that, that the data has shown that that's actually going to survive, uh, save lives. Um, is that something that you think that we should have um, in public meeting places um, for the, uh, just in case? We do, and through uh, the budget and everything we have, um, and getting ready to implement for all of our officers to have one assigned per their person and then in their cruiser. So in an incident as such, um, we will be supplied with the necessary immediate me medical needs um, and along with the fire department trained in the TAC Med program. So if there is an active shooter event, um, the goal is to get one of our officers paired up with a uh, paramedic to come in and start rendering aid even before the situation is neutralized. And, and beyond that, we do have AADs in our building, and I believe in 2019 we did a big push in our fire department on Stop the Bleed training. And as part of that, they put Stop the Bleed kits in with our AED okay. areas. Okay. So those are in our buildings, and, and our personnel are aware of where those are as well. Um, best spot to, to check for any of these types of things are where the AEDs are, because that's likely where the first aid kit as well as tourniquets and other items would be. And I mean, the people that from Boston bombing all the way to school shootings, it's whatever you can grab, usually belts and shirts and T-shirts and things like that. And um, you want to talk about our open house this Saturday from 10 to 2? What all, all work? Huh? Oh, you're going to do I, that. I don't oh. Steal thunder. oh, I didn't know that. Sorry. <laughs> it's going to be a great any program. Addition, any additional questions? Okay. I would say that in the years I've been sitting at this side of the table, I have contemplated that several times. In the, the five years I've been here, there was just one person that came to this meeting about a year and a half ago, and I was pretty concerned about that person, what they were going to do. I was just watching them fidget, and and uh, I've, I've internally got a plan for that myself. So. And, and while Dean is here, I do want to thank him and his team for how quickly they responded to the incident at Pleasant Run Middle School. Absolutely. We've met with the school district to debrief, talk about what went wrong, what went right, what could be done better. And the commonality I heard every time that I spoke with them, the thing that went the most right was how quickly our team responded. And that's in big part to Dean, his training, and his team. So thank you. I can thank witness you. it watching your guys go down Colerain Avenue. Yeah. Team effort all the way around. It was amazing. In front, of, in front of anyone in the audience, when you're sitting up here, I can see out through the second set of doors into the parking lot. And I'm always conscious of who's uh, coming into the lobby and, and so on and so forth. So I do watch for that. And we, when, I've always kind of lived my life that way of knowing what's going on around me. And in the situational awareness class that I do through our Citizens Police Academy, I challenge them. You know, everybody goes into Kroger's the same way and they do the same loop up and down the same aisles. Or how many exits are you passing if something breaks out the front of the store, how you came in? How else are you going to leave that store because you can't get out the same way you came in? So challenging them to 
um, obviously not breach anything that they're not allowed to breach, but be observant to exit signs and everything else um, to know what they're capable of doing and which way they can get out if something does happen. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for your work. All right. Um, we will move on to citizens' address. Um, and there are a couple in here that I'm going to need help with the names. I can't read the handwriting. Um, Scott, can you go out and see if there's one more out there? Uh, first, we have uh, Mr. McVeigh. Good evening, sir. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, board. If you want to share with your, is that on? No. Uh, it was good to hear the strategic plan. I, I just want to say uh, you guys are spending it at a way that uh, doesn't seem to uh, reflect uh, where the general populace is. You know, we've come through a pandemic. There are people who are still not working fully. Inflation's at a high rate. And I understand the, the economy and investing for the future, but you have people who are struggling today. And uh, it, it's a little bit troubling to see what we're doing and, and the way that we're spending. In the last meeting, I talked with you a little bit about some things that I observed looking at the township's data around how they utilize their fire response teams. <clears throat> and I shared with you that uh, the, the, the approach seemed to change in 2011, and that since then, uh, the data would suggest that when you see a fire truck going out, 5% of the time they're going to a fire, and uh, about 70% of the time they're assisting uh, EMT people. Now the fire chief came in after me and they talked about the fact that uh, they don't send a uh, fire truck with uh, every EMT and I didn't suggest that. I'm just looking at the data and the data would say that 70% of the time these fire trucks are assisting EMT in some way. <laughs> I mention that because that, that consumes people and materials and those are what drive significantly the fire department's expense as uh, the finance director has talked about almost 80% of the budgets and, and people and salaries and that kind of stuff. The chief also mentioned, because I had poked a little bit of fun at him when I said that, you know, uh, if you have a sewer line in your house that's a problem, you call the plumber. You don't, uh, you don't build a new house. And, and the chief was said to me after I left, didn't have time to talk with him, that, um, that the firehouse was built in 1930 and it wasn't built for both men and women. Well, I did some work a little while ago, and I found it in the city of Cincinnati. They have at least five firehouses that are older than uh, the one that we are talking about now. That alone is not, uh, is not a significant issue, but it just says that there are people who are, who are working in conditions that are probably similar. And if we needed to, to um, you know, add an additional bunk area to accommodate both sexes, at the Galbraith office, we, we, could have looked, we could have looked at how much that costs versus building a whole new fire station. So I just bring that to your attention. And if you're really interested in trying to control your expenditures, those are the kind of things you do. I point these out because these are voting issues when uh, the next election comes up. We expect trustees to, to be frugal managers of our money, to penetrate how the expenditures are being made to ask the tough questions. Now, I understand it's not easy to ask the fire chief or the police chief questions. They don't like to be pushed back on, and, but I don't mind doing that. Somebody has to do it. And let me give you an example just tonight that you have going on here. <clears throat> you have before you um, the, the uh, proposals to build two fire stations. Now, if you look closely at the data, the need for two fire stations is probably kind of shaky. Because with five stations today, we have at least two, 102 and 103, that aren't fully utilized. And they, they, they could, you know, if we made some changes to how we address responses, and if we thought over about how we're, how we're uh, working with Springfield Township and needing their days, we would have less of a demand on our people, and, and it would reduce our expenditures. But now I have two firehouses 
on the docket. And I, ever about three months ago, I said to you guys, I think you only need one, if you look at your data, penetrate it. You know, if, it, if it's spending your money it, like it's your own, you do, you do penetrate it and say, give me some proof. I want some hard proof that we actually need two new stations to run this place. And oh, by the way, if we get two new stations, how are things gonna be better? What really is gonna change? Will our service be better? We don't know, there's no commitments made around that. The other thing is, we're building two fire stations of different sizes. I went that, through this with a school system around building schools. I challenged you guys initially, why don't you, if you're gonna build two, I don't think you need them, but if you're gonna build two, why don't you build them the same? Who made the decision that one station be, should be 17,000 square feet and the other should be 15,000 square feet? That decision alone, okay, when you roll it out into interest over, I guess it's gonna be 20 years, is a one and a half to two million dollar decision. Who makes a one and a half, two and a half million, a two million dollar decision around added space without being challenged? I mean, come on. You know, this is the money of the people in the township. We, each, we need to be asking hard questions to our administration. Prove it. And there is no proof that I've seen. If there is, I'd like to see it. It's the same thing I asked for the chief around how he's running his response teams. If in fact he has the data that says the way we're launching our fire response teams is saving additional lives or improving the health of, of, of the, uh, the residents, show me. Let's get it up there and look at it. Let's not hide it. I made that statement in the last meeting. I said, I'd be glad to sit down with the chief. Anybody go through the data. Nobody called me. I know it's tough, but that's what we elected you people. We elected you to ask tough questions and to give them praise when they deserve it. And a lot of times they need it. They get, deserve, they get praised and they deserve it. But when you're spending money like this in a situation where the broad population is not well healed, it makes no sense. No one up here in the township that I know of lost income during Mr. the- Mr. McVeigh, we had time for, do you need additional time? One more minute. Okay, uh, so I move that we provide Mr. McVeigh with an additional minute. I second I it. appreciate okay. that. So, you know, people up here made it through the pandemic with full pay. You're talking about using, you know, seven or eight million dollars of money from the federal government. A lot of people didn't have that. And you guys are spending like it's no, there's no end. And the strategic plan is showing that. It makes no sense to the ordinary person. And these are voting issues. I promise you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have, if I get this right, uh, Greg McGahey. Greg from Dallas, Texas. Zoning, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I guess uh, Mr. Bouvier from Dallas, Texas is zoning as well. I, I, I thought that was kind of strange. I'm like, wow. Um, uh, Ms. Moore is not from Dallas, Texas. I don't think. All right. Thanks for coming. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good, good evening. Good evening. It's been that kind of day. Um, I have some questions, but I took the liberty of typing them out for you, Mr. Waller, and I will hand them to you when I'm finished. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, I watched the last two meetings on my computer and please talk into the microphone. There's so many times, Matt, you're no problem. We can right. hear you no matter what. But Dan a couple of times, and I think Jeff, um, and then somebody walked up there and they were talking and you couldn't hear what they said. So please make sure that people at home can hear you. And I just have a couple of comments um, after watching those previous meetings. Uh, first of all, I was stunned at first to hear that the additional fee addendum in the firehouse contract was not approved by the board, but yet not surprised. 
I think this type of thing happened many times with the previous administrator, and I hope that practice will be corrected. Mr. Waller talked about departments making some expense cuts, if I remember correctly. We need to increase the wages for police and fire, and maybe we could eliminate the two-week vacation that new employees receive as soon as they're hired. That would save some money. And I also, um, there were four employees this year who were hired this year and left this year and received um, payouts for their vacation that they wouldn't have gotten because they weren't here over a year. Um, the township will receive, the, I got a question about this, um, $7.5 million. It's American Rescue Plan. And what exactly is that? Um, and how, how did it come about? And is it just a lump sum to be used however we see fit? Is it broken down by any amount for police or fire, et cetera? The previous funds we received in 2020 and 2021 for COVID relief were used for salaries and expenses of both departments according to the records that I have. It was mentioned that if another employee may be needed to, oh, maybe another employee would be needed to take rent, rental registrations. And is there a possibility that rental registrations could be uh, done online to make it easier for everybody? And are those due, will those be required to register at any designated time or just whenever a new property sells or a, or a new tenant may move into a property? Um, traffic studies, if changes are recommended, does that happen after the completion of the development? Is the burden on the Hamilton County engineer or the developer? And do we know what changes will need to be made for the new developments? I was thinking the development on Springdale, the one on Kemper, or the one on Pippin, um, I would think that we would need more than two lanes for ingress and egress of the amount of people that are gonna be moving into those developments. The Veterans Dinner is a great recognition of, for all veterans. Is the township paying for that? And if so, has the board approved a dollar amount? Department heads, according to their job descriptions, are not required to attend meetings. Do they receive comp time for attending meetings? Several years ago, the state auditor recommended a policy for gifts and donation. The previous administrator refused by playing dumb and saying we do have a policy. We do not have a policy for spending township funds for giving gifts and donating funds. Would you please develop one? And Mr. Salman will be starting as a full-time employee on January 1st, I believe. And will he maintain his full-time position at the law firm and still be the law director for several other communities? Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and we will respond to those after I think this is probably uh, zoning as well. Um, uh, Rado Ra 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 from Lansdale, Pennsylvania. All right. And that leaves Ms. Wright. Did those folks get to speak at zoning? Okay. They sure did. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I have a few things that I'd like to ask questions about that I heard tonight um, about a blitz in Northbrook for zoning and codes. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. We need a blitz in the township 
stop separating one area from the other, please. We are a community, do not divide us. We have the same issues in Grosbeck, White Oak, and Northbrook. We deserve to be blitzed evenly. Um, Mr. Um, Waller, you s made a great attempt at getting engagement going between the residents and the department heads, and that is to be a kind of question and answer session from 6 to 7 uh, p.m. on meeting nights. I was wondering if you have any feedback on that, and maybe that's something that our communications director could put out on social media. Uh, a lot of residents might be intimidated by coming up to speak and I think if they knew they had the opportunity to stop by and maybe engage with one of the department heads on a question they had, I think that would be fabulous. But I'd also like to say that the Citizens Fire Academy is a wonderful program that's presented by the township. Uh, I had the honor of completing that program and um, it's fabulous. They do a great job and I would encourage anyone who's interested to get your application in. I'm glad to see that the org chart has returned to the agenda packet. Um, there for a while, it seems to be missing in action, but it is back, and that is very helpful for people who care or want to know who is where and why and all that kind of stuff. Um, I also was absent a few meetings and watched them online, and I tell you what, I was never so upset as how the board engaged with other residents that took their time to come up here and discuss issues with you. It was like, oh, hey, well, you're welcome. What can you say? Oh, come back up. We can't hear you. I'm up here. I get five minutes. That's it. No engagement, no communication. If you're going to practice what you preach, then do it for every resident. If you're going to engage with some, engage with all. That's not fair. Also, I was wondering if there was an update on the Kroger, the old Kroger building and Grippos. Is that still something that's happening? The building is deteriorating by the day. Trash, graffiti, it is, it's an eyesore, and I was just hoping that um, Grippos was coming into play for that. I'd also like to give a shout out to all the people who ran in political elections this year. Great job on picking up your signs. I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but throughout the township, the majority of political signs have been picked up, and that is fabulous. That's part of the game. Um, I'd also like to bring up um, Um, every year the township uh, sends a notice to Hamilton County about abated properties in our community and then those are assessed on the taxes. I think that happens somewhere around September. I was wondering if that has happened and last year there were quite a few that the township missed that were abated. We paid the company to cut the grass, clean up the junk, but it never made it to the taxes. I was wondering how that is being handled. And then I have one other thing for you about um, a receipt that I saw for the university club. Um, the township went there for some reason. I don't know who, why, or what, but we paid the University Club of Cincinnati to have a meeting there. And we also paid tax on it, or tax exempt. So I was just wondering if you could check into that, and I think we need just a little more explanation on invoices of what this was, what transpired here. If I bought coffee or tea for somebody, I want to know who and why it was, what it was for. Thank you. Is this the same? They're two different ones, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any, I, I have no other folks meaning, uh, that are on the list here to speak. Um, we will start, I'll start with the university club. That was your leadership retreat, right? Yes, that was okay. the leadership retreat. Um, and I, I don't know why we pay taxes. We should not have. Uh, that was handled back in August, I believe, 
and uh, we've had some transition since that time. So okay. Um, so let me. I, I will start. Um, Mr. McVeigh, I don't. I don't think he had questions. He had observations. I don't know if you want to um, speak to any of his observations or. I will defer to Chief Walls on that. I'm okay. sure he's got some points he would. All right, Ms. Mort said talking to the microphone. Yep. Um, um, so maybe I don't understand the vacation policy. I, I thought that you get plugged in. Yes. You get zero on day one. At and the then end, each at time the end you end work, your first paycheck, you get. So you're at the zero to five year range. You get three hours of vacation time. And so there were employees who worked for say six months. And they earned three hours every two weeks, and they were entitled to that payout because that was the policy that you all decided on back when we changed it, I believe, in either 2020 or 2021. Yeah, 20, 20, I thought 2019, but okay, 20. 19. Is there any position at the township that I start day one that I get two weeks vacation? You don't get two weeks, but in the fire department, day one, they calculate the amount of hours that you would earn from your day of start through the end of the year. So fire department, union fire employees, say one is starting on uh, July 1st, they would get one week of vacation through the end of the first year. Right now, that is the only department and the only employees that get any vacation on day one of their employment. Okay. And, and there if is... They, if they leave, does that come out of their last check? If they took more vacation than they earned? I will have to triple check what we put in the CBA, but I believe we did put that language in this CBA to address that issue. All right, this seven and a half million uh, uh, funding is, that's a pretty complicated answer. Um, there are federal guidelines. Yeah, so there's a, there's a whole litany of federal guidelines uh, to sort of summarize those dollars. They came from the federal government. They allocated them to most of the communities across the country based off of per capita. Townships in Ohio were excluded except for three, and that was us, Green Township, and Westchester because our population was over 50,000. All other townships in the state of Ohio did not get money directly from the federal government. Uh, those were two lump sum checks, which we received this year. So there's seven and a half million dollars from the federal government that is in the bank. Uh, we are required to spend that, that those dollars within, I believe, two more years. Um, and like I said, there are a litany of requirements on how we can spend it. The easiest way to spend it is what's called revenue replacement. The federal government has told communities that if you have under $10 million that you're receiving from us, you can claim it as revenue replacement, which means we don't care what you spend it on, but you have to spend it legally and within the federal guidelines. So the easiest way for us to do that would be to offset salaries and key funds, freeing up dollars so we can spend those on other projects. And I know over the course of the last, whatever, 18 months, there's been I mean, at least new guidance eight to eight to ten times on on from uh, how that should be spent. Yep, whatever. and there will be a special audit of these dollars specifically, uh, just like we had with the CARES dollars. And uh, you know, our hope is that if we're able to spend these dollars within one year, that prevents us from having two audits on these dollars. And and doing one is certainly cheaper for us because the state auditor charges us each time that they come in to do an audit of our operations. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of ten to thirty thousand dollars, depending on how in depth they want to go on the audit. Um, there's also reporting guidelines that we have to do at the federal level. So quarterly, I believe Mr. McElravey has to file a report with the feds to demonstrate what dollars we have spent from that to date. And so once we start start spending those dollars in 2023, he will have uh, a more robust report than right now, which is that we've taken no action on those dollars. All right. Uh, with regard to traffic studies, uh, the traffic improvements. Who's responsible? Um, and is it done before or after, uh, not the study, but the actual improvement? Um. I have not once had the county, any person in the county, reach out to me or any of our offices to say, this is what our traffic study says. Right. These are the improvements that we are requiring of a developer. Um, my understanding, just on, on how this works from other communities, is that it would be at the developer's expense if the traffic study did warrant some major improvements. Um, however, I would imagine that it would also be at the county's discretion if they wanted to take on that, that burden. But they, uh, they tend to not involve us at all in that process, and that's a, a statutory thing. The only time I've ever recalled getting traffic studies are actually from the developers themselves and not from the county yes. or, or from um, our offices here. And they occasionally do that when they're bringing forward a zoning case if they believe traffic may be a concern of residents. Uh, the difficulty there, too, is if we were to make a decision based off of traffic, we would be liable to a lawsuit for 
it going outside the scope of what we are legally allowed to to weigh as we're viewing zoning. They, they weigh, weigh that at the county neighborhoods commission. Uh, yeah, so that's through the county subdivision guidelines and the subdivision process. All right, the veterans dinner. Um, I, I I've known this, but I've forgotten. I know that. Uh, yep. Who's paying? Township is paying for that. Uh, dollars were set aside. It was in the organizational meeting. We set aside the dollars there as well as in the budget. There was a line item specific for this dinner. It is $1,500, I believe, that we've set aside for this event. Okay. Um, and this is, this is a, a, something that very early on I wanted to bring forward uh, to um, uh, show appreciation to the veterans. Um, comp time for attending meetings for department heads? Department heads are exempt. They get no overtime or comp time or anything like that. However, if their schedule allows and their work allows, they are entitled to flex their time, as it's called. So it's not in comp time is usually time and a half, whereas flex time would be hour for hour. So, you know, let's say that a department head is here until midnight. That means that they probably worked an extra eight hour shift. And let's say they are completely caught up on all their work and they want to leave a little early, maybe a couple hours early. That's something that is well within their right to do so. And I will point out just, just for the record that Mr. Weckback, any time that he takes has to be approved by the president, which is usually on a rotating basis. But uh, for instance, you have a, a, a day off that you took or taking um, that I signed today. Okay. Uh, yeah. I did not know you said that. That's in your mailbox, so, yes. Okay. Um, so there is a, a check and balance on that. Um, on uh, So I, I think there's confusion uh, about uh, Mr. Solomon's status as a full-time employee, and, and maybe we could review uh, uh, review that. And what, what the difference is between Mr. Solomon now and Mr. Solomon January 1st? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I will defer to Scott as, uh, on that uh, item. Um. So the, the only difference really is that I will be considered an OPRS employee and what that means. And that, that's what I was a couple years ago when Larry and I both were. Um, I still will submit invoices to the township for the hours that I perform work with. Uh, the only difference is, and, and quite frankly, our rate is at 160 right now. Part of the reason that uh, the OPRS is a benefit to me, we did increase other townships. We charge 185 per hour. Um, part of the negotiation was to make me an OPERS and just me, not any other associate, just myself. That would, in, I think, increase, I think, a 14% match by the, the township, but that is also counted against the, the cap. So that will be, it'll just be like it is right now, except there'll be, there's going to be no increment with respect to the per hour rate, and the 14% will count against the cap. That's really the extent of it. And there was some additional negotiation that went on with regard to uh, additional billable hours, which we anticipated facing uh, with regard to some of the some of the property uh, compliance complaints that, that we have. That's correct. So that, that's really the extent, though, as far as me being an employee, um, I'll just be able to, it, with respect to, you know, OPERS. As, uh, and, and I'll still be working. I work for other entities as well, and I don't anticipate, um, you know, qu quitting those positions either no I am not given a salary we, we have a cap um, so every every month whether it's myself or my associate or anyone at the firm uh, at, we bill at 160 an hour based on the time we sent we spent we go ahead and send an invoice to the township and then that's that's paid off every month so you know roughly uh, Ten thousand dollars. If it's that, uh, if we spend that, you know, then um, it's only we can't go anything more than one hundred thirty thousand dollars in one one year. There was one year I think when Larry was participating with respect to it. I think it was when before Jeff Mills got hired as administrator. He was he went to a number of meetings, and our firm had hit the cap at the end of August. And so for September, October, November, and December. We didn't, even though we performed work for the township, we held true to our you know, our agreement, and we we didn't. Even though I don't think we necessarily foresaw that he was going to be involved in those, I mean, a number of meetings. We we, I mean, our, our our firm worked for, and we've been for the most part been able to stay under that cap since that point. That was only the, the really the only bad year that we had. But other than that, um, you know, and I think. Initially, way back when, when we started, it was 150 an hour back in 2012. 
as it is right now, it's 116 hour. So we really, I mean, if you, <laughs> I ask you to, to ask around some other attorneys, see what their rates are. Um, we're, we're very comparable. And I think even from, I'd like you to look and, and see what, what you paid overall and from 2005 to 2011. I mean, I'd, I'd challenge you to go back and, and see what you guys paid, the township paid it back then as well. And I'll, I would maintain that we're even comparable back to those rates, um, if not better. So um, that's that's pretty much the extent as as far as us. So at this point, you're going back to the way you and Larry had New York personally paying the full amount of the OPERS? The OPERS will be paid by the township, but it's that will be included in the invoice. You know, it'll be come off the cap, if that makes sense. So it's really for whenever I pay, it'll be whatever I you know bill that month, however many hours times 160 and then another 14 percent of that total which for just me because I'm the only one like if you see Miss Shield up here that she'll just be billing at 160 an hour and that's it and it's it's only a benefit it's a benefit for me because I've got time in the system based on you know working for the county uh, and probation working as a law clerk and other entities too that I I'm, I'm salaried on and have you know, for some entities, I, I, I'm also OPRS in, in that regard as well. And, and I'll let the other two board members answer this in their reports. And for me, the 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 added benefit the added benefit for the township was um, in the reduction in in additional hours cost. We I felt that that was a um, that was a net gain financially for uh, the township. But but others can respond to that. Um, so the blitz, um, I, I think. Oh, uh, the last thing is so policy for donations and gifts. Um, Mr. Wackback. Yep, so we have a policy for donations. We do not have a policy for gifts. My recollection is that we've had this discussion several times, and the board did not provide directives for us to draft a policy on gifts. And I think part of that was when we started to peel back the onion, there, okay. were, wait, there, was, there was that question, what's a gift? There were desires from the board to maybe not limit themselves. So if you have an employee that, say, reaches 50 years of their service, is that a circumstance where the board may want to purchase a small token of gratitude for an employee being around that long? And I think at that time, if I'm remembering correctly and paraphrasing, the board had said, we're not gonna adopt necessarily a policy on this, but what we are going to do is if there is ever a time when we might purchase a gift, it will be a separate standalone item on the agenda for consideration. That's how I recall it as well. Yeah, that we would yeah. vote on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, maybe we need to just make that uh, um, uh, make that in writing and policy so people can hold us accountable if we don't follow it. Sure. I mean, that's that's easy to write down. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Uh, uh, to Ms. Uh, uh, Wright's comment about the Blitz and, and other uh, should be township-wide. So, so the idea behind targeting a particular neighborhood is to create large-scale impact and change at, at one point in time. So uh, you tend to see this uh, in larger communities where if you try to do everything, you're probably not going to have a to uh, the time to do everything. But if you focus on specific nodes and specific areas, so even when we say code enforcement blitz Northbrook, we're not saying it's going to be even the entire neighborhood of Northbrook. It's probably going to be three or four specific streets where we know that there are high volumes of correctable offenses that are going to lead to some really quick turnarounds in results in terms of code enforcement improvements that will click quickly improve property values and what have you. What you do is you do it there, and then once you've got that model, you start to rotate it. But you have to develop the model first, test it, and then you start to rotate through other parts of the community as well. Okay, um, and I think the idea about the, uh, so the six to 7 p.m. question and answer, um, um, I have not received any feedback. Um, I don't know if anybody else has. I think it would be a fantastic idea for the communications director to, uh, um, to, to kind of push that out. Um, you know, it, it, to me, the police and fire have had a really successful coffee with the chiefs. It makes it seem a little bit more informal, and it's more of a discussion nature. Is I mean, you know, meeting with the department heads seems like it could be onerous, and I mean, go on, no, no offense to the department heads, but it could be going like going to the dentist or something. And well, I think that's where we leave it up to the uh, communications magistry of Helen to come up with a very fun way to entice people to come and meet with our folks if they have questions and. Just making it known that they're available. Um, the feedback I have gotten from department heads is that they have not had much 
to any engagement during that hour just yet. Um, my hope is that we continue to look for those opportunities. Certainly as folks come to the dais, uh, they do have that hour beforehand as well to, to speak with department heads too. And then you know they're able to provide perspective on what they've heard from us as well, in addition to the comments that they're wanting to make to you all. So that as you all make your decisions and provide feedback from us, you're able to get some of that information ahead of time. And for example, we couldn't have done it today, but I have noticed in the three years that I've been here that uh, all of our department heads we've had have been very, if there's a, a very approachable about a need during a meeting, that I've oftentimes seen a department head leave the room uh, with a constituent and go solve a problem out in the hallway a lot. Um, and But let's, I think it's important also to formalize it that six to seven and realize that, you know, that, that these folks are approachable and that they're, I think it showcases the fine work that they are doing. So I think it's a great idea. And we did just have that event about two months ago where all our department heads were there and we had probably about 30 or 40 residents come and speak to all our department heads. Uh, yeah. Are you referencing the town hall? Yes. Okay. Yep. And I know on, with regard to Kroger and Grippos, I know there's been some movement. I don't know if I'm a, I don't know what I'm allowed to say because I think they're in negotiations or. Grippos has told us that they are no longer moving forward on that site. That site is back on the market. Um, I can tell you all board that if there's interest in that site being self storage, that could happen in an instant, but I don't believe that that is the highest and best use for that location. Um, so that is just something to keep I was told that there was someone else that was interested. Has that fallen through? Uh, there are other parties that are interested, but nothing has materialized formally that we can talk about at this point. So we can't get rid of the, and I think I'm just guessing that part of Ms. Wright's problem is the same problem I have, getting rid of all the semis in the parking lot, but it's really not our lot. So we can't, um, our hands are a little bit tied. Is that the case? Or? To the extent that there's a zoning violation, we can pursue that. Outside of that, there is not anything more we can do. Okay. Can we look at that and see if there is? Um, I, I want to hold them accountable for it. Yep. Um, and um, the abated properties, um, I, I talked to um, Chief about this, uh, Chief Cordy about this a couple weeks ago, um, and there, there was an issue, and I talked to you about it as well. Uh, this summer there were some, some issues with, with the way these were being billed out, but that has been taken care of, I guess. Is that where we're at? I distinctly recall conversations outside of my office with Sergeant Penley and a staff member that was assisting him in getting the uh, abatements down to the county auditors on time before the end of September. And now the issues we need the auditors in the midst of, I, I guess the new auditor doesn't take office till January 1st, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so uh, we need to make sure that that gets, that gets uh, credited. And I answered about the university club retreat and I think, I think I've gotten them all. Um, yes. So the university club was, um, so the question from the audience, because we cannot hear, hear that, the university club was for the, um, the, the retreat that annually is done with the department heads, um, where they uh, uh, talk about um, uh, some of the initiatives going forward for the next year. Last year, I think it was done at, um, at the law offices of, uh, Frost Brown Todd. Bill Sites. I don't know what the one. It Frost, was at Frost, Frost Brown Todd. Fra Frost Brown and Todd. Todd. This year, I guess we didn't have that contact, and it was done at the University Club. I don't. What I do with the right machine? Here. Yeah. Um, yes. And that's the two-day, um, the two-day event. One uh, was fire. One was police. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, um, moving on to administrative reports. Yes, first up with administrative reports is Chief Allen Walls from the Fire Department. Chief, welcome back. Good evening once again. Now for my, for my administrative report, uh, incident responses in October of 2022, we had 851 EMS incidents. We had 203 fire incidents. We made 43 responses into the Springfield Township EMS contract area. Uh, we had the one significant building fire on Indian Woods Drive that was a $90,000 loss. Our value total loss for the month was $90,500. Value saved was $600,640. Average response time for the arrival of the first unit was five minutes and 20 seconds. 
and first unit on the scene less than six minutes was 67.69%. A uh, couple of things to point out here. Uh, captain Dower, our EMS captain, graduated from the Ohio Fire Executive Program. This is administered by the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association. It's a two and a half year executive development program. Uh, as I stated, uh, Captain Dower is our EMS captain. Uh, I would expect uh, in the near future, uh, and perhaps by the time I leave, uh, he will continue to uh, rise through the ranks and become a chief officer. Uh, Captain Rui was nominated uh, to be on the board of directors of the International Association of Arson Investigators. There will be an election for that uh, forthcoming, and he'll know um, whether or not he's elected to that board. Uh, as far as communications, I'll just sing Helen's praises. Uh, she does a great job, uh, and that probably doesn't even sum it up. So. Uh, we can't say enough, at least in the fire department, what Helen does as far as communications. Uh, as far as um, statements, why do we have two different size firehouses? We have different complements of personnel and different complements of apparatus in those two fire stations. Hence, one's about 15,000 square feet. The other one's gonna be about 13,000 square feet. So they don't have the same complement of apparatus and personnel, hence the, the, the difference in size. Uh, as far as why we do what we do um, in respect to research, the Firefighter Safety and Deployment Study Report on EMS Field Experiments conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the International Association of Fire Chiefs, the International <coughs> Association of Firefighters, the Worcester Polytechnical Institute, uh, Commission on Fire Accreditation International, Urban Institute, University of North Carolina School of Medicine, and EMS PIC has a number of uh, studies that they did in respect to apparatus for EMS incidents. So there is research in respect to, you know, why we do what we do. Um, as far as uh, reaching out, um, <coughs> I will have our EMS captain make contact and um, we will have a meeting at the fire headquarters and we will explain why we do what we do. Um, can I quantify the number of persons <coughs> that we saved last month with the EMS system that we have? No. Can I qualify after 27 years of experience as a, a fire and EMS professional and 25 of those as a paramedic that responding with the appropriate number of persons in an appropriate amount of time, triage, treating and transporting them to the appropriate facility, does it make a difference in people's lives? Yes. Yes, um, and unless anybody has any questions for me. I, I'm gonna have an item in my trustee report, but I'll go ahead and ask you to make a recommendation to any community members that, that consider cooking in their garages or having a deep fryer or a gas grill in their garage. I know I had addressed that issue with you the other day about a complaint that I had, a concern I had received from a concerned resident. Do you have any recommendations about cooking in the garage just for the community to know? Uh, could possibly give us something to do. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, yeah, and thank you. And one of the things I, we discussed a couple of weeks ago is the best fire department would be one that never had to leave the firehouse with an ambulance that never had to leave, and that's through community education programs. Um, we are nowhere near that point, but I appreciate you uh, sending our risk reduction person over to that address to, to perhaps discuss with the residents the pluses and minuses of cooking in the garage. And Captain Walsh did stop by, and he's gonna make uh, another visit uh, or two to sort out what exactly is going on there. Okay. Thank you, and with your comments with you'll, regard you'll to the- You have to let oh. me know, so. <laughs> uh, with your, cook in your garage. <laughs> with your comments regarding assisting EMT, uh, this is frustrating. I, I indicated that the first time we met, it's frustrating to me, but um, that's, uh, I mean, the that's why we're trying to hit hit the, kind of the supply end by doing community paramedicine is that this model, I, I don't have any disagreement that the model does need to change, but I, I thought, you know what, maybe maybe Chief Walls is just being alarmist on this. So I went and talked to a couple other people from other departments, and they said not only when the fire, and a lot of times there's so much equipment that the police officer responding has to help, and you're going up steps, and, and you know, it, it's, it's one thing to look at it on a balance sheet, and it's another thing when it's, you know somebody's loved one that's in jeopardy, and I and I get that that fire doesn't do fire as much anymore as they do 
uh, as they do um, uh, advanced life support and things like that. But it takes every bit of it. If somebody has to run, you know, I'm not going to know the medical names, terms from it, but there, everybody has a job there. There's nobody standing around. That, that's correct. Um, and, and I think the misnomer sometimes is, you know, we have that term fire truck. Um, and 30 years ago, it wasn't an unfair term. That's what it did. It went to fires. Uh, now, you know, our apparatus is, is more or less a multi-purpose response vehicle. And that fire truck is set up as such. It can go to a fire. It can go to an auto extrication. It can go to a false alarm. It can go to an EMS call. Um, and within you know, this research here, it shows that crew size and configuration and time on scene matters. If we can send the appropriate units um, with the appropriate equipment and personnel, and we can package you two minutes quicker, two minutes can make a difference for a person who's having a heart attack, who's having a stroke, right. uh, who's been shot or stabbed or, or otherwise. And so, um, you know, th there was that, discussion about those fire trucks on those EMT calls. So last month there were 851 EMS incidents, 470 times, you know, a fire truck was on those, so about half the time. Now of that 470, can I quantify right now for you how many times that fire truck was actually closer and it got there two minutes quicker than an ambulance? I, I can't, I, I could drill down and tell you that, but generally speaking, um, you know, like we talked about uh, at the last meeting, we go to great lengths to right size our approach with personnel and apparatus to limit the loss of life and property. We don't, um, we don't send too much. We try not to send too little. And um, yeah, there we have it. And all that's triage. You're not gonna, you, that's part of what, what your people do when they get on the phone. You're not gonna send, uh, you know, I broke my leg. You're not gonna send advanced ALS. You're not going to send the fire truck. You're going to send the the, the uh, ambulance, the bus, um, and it, that's I, I, that's not a perfect system. Um, some people have picked up uh, computer programs, but I'd rather somebody, a human voice on the other line, make that decision than like a computer program. And I've talked at length with uh, Chief Mueller, Assistant Chief Mueller, about some of these new technology that's coming out that'll make the decision for fire. That is makes me so wildly uncomfortable that I couldn't even express. Um, I don't mind the difficult questions, and I don't mind being uncomfortable. The only way we grow is to be uncomfortable. Life would be boring if we were just comfortable. So. All right. Well, thank you so much thank for you, for everything. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Thank you. So the next administrative report is delivered by Police Chief Ed Cordy, who, in addition to his stats, will tell us about his open house. I hear so. I did not know that on the agenda. <clears throat> Just trying to get more people to come to your open house. Well, I figured Dean wasn't prepared to talk about that yet. Okay. A little bit of a hook to try to help him out. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. For the month of October, we responded to 3,794 calls for service, uh, which is over 122 calls per day. It's actually a decrease of 2% from October of 2021, but we're still on pace for uh, exceeding over 46,000 calls for the year. We responded to all emergency calls within uh, 2.71 minutes, so about 2 minutes and 42 seconds. Conducted 152 traffic stops, making 7 OVI arrests for the month. There were two use of force, one being a usage of OC and another being a usage of taser. During the month, we did not have any traffic pursuits and we had 114 physical arrests. We opened one internal investigation. Jumping over to code enforcement, we handled 140 inspections. We closed 73 violations, uh, 17 total property maintenance violations, and 10 total zoning violations. This Saturday, November 19th, we are concluding our Stuff the Trailer event. We will then be taking those donations to Sun Ministries. Also on the, on the, uh, the 19th, we'll be holding our open house. Here at the station in the administrative complex. The event will have the following stations. It's not all of these stations, but kind of give a, a quick rundown of what we're, we're looking to do. Uh, our public safety cadets will be on hand. We'll have our simulator uh, room up and running downstairs, allowing citizens and whoever wish to, uh, to come through to experience not only the training and the type of calls that we respond to, but some of the different 
ways that we try to, um, the, the coin phrase everybody likes to use is de-escalation and kind of have people work through uh, just different training and different simulator. I don't know if everybody or anyone here has had that opportunity, but it's, it's a pretty challenging and, and informative uh, experience. Uh, I'm gonna recreate the coffee with the chief in my, uh, in my office and get to hang out and talk with whoever would like to come in and discuss anything with me. Plenty of K-cups on hand that I paid for, but you know, here nor there for that part, and I can take care of that. Um, we will have our recruitment video playing downstairs, and uh, this is the type of thing that we like to go, and we, we post online, and we'll take it to uh, wherever we like to go and just show people what to expect if you came and worked for Corning Township. Um, we will have stations for our CPA and CFA, where folks are able to sign up for our uh, academies and try to show up uh, and try to get more, more interest in those. And of course, the most important and probably the most uh, seen thing that people will do is we will have our canines on hand. Yeah. Uh, that's what everyone loves. Everyone likes to see the demonstrations of which we do. Uh, we'll probably have some sort of, as they refer to as bite work. I'm not sure who gets to get uh, put on the glove or the outfit. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be one of the handlers who are trained to handle this, but um, both dogs will be there, and uh, Brian, of course, and as well as Zach Meyer will be there as well. Uh, he left, uh, but uh, just a quick shout out to Dean for his response for Pleasant Run Middle School. I was, um, unfortunately, fortunately, I, I'm not sure which, how to refer to this yet, uh, I was in training in Columbus for a mandated um, ORC uh, for a new chief uh, training. So I, um, I actually heard about it first from Mr. Buck what was going on while I'm sitting in class. And I started to have that old moment. And then I realized who was back at the office handling things for me. Um, Dean and I've worked for a long time together with the school district. I don't, there's not a single person within our organization that knows the in and outs and the works of our actual school uh, response plan is, is him. So I felt immediately better knowing that. So 100% uh, everything that the school, school board said, I completely agree. He did a fantastic job from start to finish. Uh, our Citizens Police Academy, I'm sorry, Class 48. Class 48 will be graduating uh, next Thursday. Um, here actually in this room. Thursday. Thursday. This Thursday, I'm sorry. I don't even know what day it is today. So uh, two days from now, they'll be graduating uh, in this room here. Uh, and then a, a quick rundown of um, our impact unit. Unfortunately, our impact unit is, is gonna be locked in the hiring mode for quite some time. Uh, but that still doesn't stop our uh, our machine that we have named Brian Huntington. He still continues to go out there with, uh, and he, he's making an unbelievable amount of traffic stops and the amount of rust he's making as well. And frankly, it's contagious. So our, our new officers are seeing the amount of work and the amount of things that he's bringing in, and they're loving every single second of it. Uh, just yesterday, Brian was um, worked with UPS, and we had a suspicious package call. Brian made his way up to uh, up to the the package with uh, his partner Teo, and Teo did a sniff of the package and recovered. Uh, after he alerted on it, we were able to open it and identify 2.2 pounds of. It's believed to be a uh, a mix between fentanyl and heroin. Uh -huh. Oh, boy. As you would say on or see on TV, a true traditional brick. This is roughly what that would have wow. would have looked like. <clears throat> uh, that's a pretty. You, know, you hear yeah. me talking about some substantial type of uh, seizures. That's that's pretty amazing. Uh, and then again today, he went out and conducted an, an additional traffic stop where he um, found a, a personal usage of fentanyl, which I'm not exactly sure, talking with Bruce, what a personal usage of fentanyl would be. But uh, people now are using fentanyl in, in, instead of heroin because I guess heroin wasn't strong enough for him. And um, he, he's continuing to, to make these traffic stops. And again, it's involving all of our additional uh, younger officers, and they're getting to see and experience some different things. So once again, he's out there tearing it up. Uh, I can't wait to be able to get the rest of our units out there with him and be able to see the, I, I always find myself directing myself to using this word impact, but I'm looking <laughs> forward to see what the impact will be in the future. So that's all I have tonight. Is there any questions for me? Just, just to clarify, the time of the open house is from 10 to 2, correct? 10 to 2. Thank you. And Chief, I just wanted to tell you thanks. All the little things I'd send you as days go by from little citizen inquiries, you you're, you promptly handle them, and I do appreciate that. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I wanted to thank you. I've seen in the last two weeks three of your officers running radar, um, and, and it 
you know, the 19-year-old me would say, oh, man, they're just trying to raise money. But now that I understand that we don't get to see any of the funds, and now that, uh, that I open the paper pretty much every morning and see a pedestrian getting hit in, in Hamilton County, this is a this is a crisis that we're having with this. I know that we had uh, in Green Township, um, was it Saturday night, the, an individual was hit um, in Elder Grad, a tragedy, um, and I think he's in intensive care. And then we had a 15-year-old high school student from Anderson Township Monday uh, that was hit and uh, on left to die on Clough Pike. And the first responder was an in individual taking his kids to work at, or picking them up from Taco Bell. He had a massive heart attack because of the stress and he died. And then and it just when you think it's, then you open up today, there was a child hit, I think, at Bond Hill. Um, it's, it's, people are driving. I, I mean, it's, it, uh, running radar and being out there is so much more important today because people just, the laws don't seem to apply to them. They're a special case. And uh, every day when I w drive down Cool Rain to work, there's at least 10 to 15 people just jumping out in front of traffic. Um, and, and then there, and then there's cars turning uh, left from the far right lane and or right from the far left lane and it's just it's a mess and, and I appreciate you guys being out there and it's it's I think I think it's gonna make it's gonna make a significant difference um, um, and, and I know it's not uh, you know the most glamorous of work but I, I really do firmly believe that it will save lives well to be honest with you most cops will tell you that's the fun part of the job okay is the proactive policing approach and if uh, getting us back to that model is, is what our hope is uh, every, everything always comes back to COVID response and how it changed everything. We're getting back to, to the proactive model and what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I'll, you, you mentioned radars, and I will say you know, thank you to, to Sergeant Jamie Penley, who may that be one of his major focuses to get them back into our police cars and get them operational again. Uh, our goals for next year in 2023 is to move on to a LIDAR-based system instead of a not just the traditional radars because radars are lasting they're longer, but I would like to continue to improve mm -hmm. what we have. And they can use the LiDAR-based system, which is, um, I affectionately refer to it as almost duck hunt, where they can sit there and point and <laughs> hit the car and be able to get it. And this, it's phenomenal for this for this exact type of thing. And it's going to increase. It's going to continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I talked to you right when you got here. I on Colerain saw all the blue cars coming right behind my office. And it was nice to see the response time. And five police officers took care of the situation. Love the keeping us safe. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. All right. So we got a very brief report out of public services this month because it is an extremely busy month. So we actually don't have any of our typical stats. We are midway through our APWA accreditation process. So that is the American Public Works Association. Their evaluators are, are actually on site and have been on site. Uh, and will be for the next couple of days. Uh, we're hoping at the conclusion of that that we will get a packet of recommended improvements to our operations and organization in this function, as well as a number of areas where they've demonstrated that we are meeting and exceeding the national standard for public works groups. Um, this is sort of a, a forensic look at all of our facility maintenance uh, approaches. It's a forensic look at all of our road maintenance, our storm sewer and stormwater maintenance, our park maintenance, all of those different things that are touched by this department. And they are heavily engrossed in that process right now. So we, we don't have our stats for that reason, but happy to answer any questions about anything going on in the department. We just saw our salt delivery. So I guess we're gearing up for a big winter. Yes, our salt is coming over the next month. Mm -hmm. You and I had this discussion, but just I want to make it for the public record. There were some questions with regard to the temporary speed um, speed calming devices on Niagara, yes, um, and uh, whether those would be made permanent or not. Um, and uh, uh, there were some issues with regard to the construction of the roads, and maybe you can yeah, and and we'll talk about this again later on the agenda. But but really, the the big difference between the permanence of those speed cushions and the non-permanence is that we did not use an epoxy seal at the very end of the installation process. So that's the one huge difference between the two. Um, at this point in the process, it would not make sense to go back and put them on. However, we keep talking about temporary, right? And what mm -hmm. does that mean? Right. These are newer products that haven't necessarily been on the market uh, for an extreme amount of time. So we don't really know how temporary this is compared to an asphalt uh, speed cushion. 
Um, I've had some additional conversations with the individual that sent that email as well um, in context of later conversation on this agenda. They, their understanding of what I've shared with them and they are actually okay with, with the recommended approach of doing something similar to what we did on Niagara as well. So, um, provide In fact, they're working them. now, let's just keep them there until to see what we can get out of them. And that was the direction of the board was to leave them on Niagara as, as long as they work, so. All right, the last one, this is, this is my white whale. 275 beautification. Um, yes. So this is something that, in all fairness, I started under Mr. Mills, and two years went by, and now we're in the third year, and, and I guess we have it bid out. Have they, last time I checked, they... I can't remember the timetable that I sent you, but it's either now or around now that it's okay. supposed to be happening. Okay. I, I do want to... I see those four little sticks out of the ground as I get off 275, and it's it's real frustrating, so... Um, all right. Um, I think that's. Yes. And then our next report will come from the zoning department or development department. Sorry. Good evening, sir. Good evening, board. Uh, volume in development department still very, very high. Uh, I think we hit a new record for October. Uh, 16 new family, uh, single family homes and permits issued for those. So that's, again, thinking about. The uh, interest rates have been climbing now for some time. Uh, spoke to one developer. He, uh, early in the year, he was qualifying new home buyers for approximately $1,200 a month. He's now trying to qualify people at $1,800 a month. So that's the challenge that he has in selling new homes. And again, with the development that we have going on around, uh, it's made it harder. Uh, we're on site today. Uh, trying to work through strategies uh, with with developers and making sure that we can uh, be a partner with them and not an obstacle. But uh, I'm I'm glad they're they're interested in building in in Colerain. Uh, we had 11 commercial permits, uh, including one business expansion. We uh, I don't know if solar's just slowing down because the the time of season, but only five solar permits. But there were 31 other permits uh, for a variety of reasons that they processed a total of 63 so it's uh, it still remains very busy uh, we're fortunate to have a new uh, staff member at the front desk uh, Caleb is doing a great job uh, eager to learn and jumping right in so he's going to be able to process uh, a lot of these permits and uh, pick up some of that slack uh, and I did uh, mention twice before and now a final answer from OKI as they gave final approval for a $266,000 uh, grant for sidewalks on pool. So that is a, a final. So any particular questions I might answer for you? So since this is in the news um, a lot, um, do we have, and, and I don't know that you know the answer to this, maybe this is a public works, do we have any idea of how many miles of roads we have of county roads and how many of those have sidewalks? <laughs> Jeff has that right on top yeah. of yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you would have said township roads, I could have answered that question. Right, I know, but, uh, I know. You know, when when you think about the county roads, that there are quite a bit. And when you look at a map of Coleraine Township, if you were to divide it uh, maybe almost diagonally um, from south, west to northeast, that's where a lot of our county roads are. Most of those are ditch roads. They don't have sidewalks. Um, other areas of the township where you do see sidewalks on county roads are either because we have taken the initiative to install them ourselves or because of our zoning re regulations, there have been changes in that property. So redevelopments. And as part of the redevelopment, you are now required to install a sidewalk. So that's why we have these, these unique situations like Compton Road, Springdale Road, Pool Road, where we have sidewalks and then we have big gaps and then we have sidewalks again and uh it can be frustrating to a pedestrian to continue to walk on and off of the sidewalk so um i know we continue to make the push at the county level that hey you all should do this too their push back to us is hey all of your peer townships do this on our streets so why would we fund these for you all and um so that's kind of the rock in the hard place but i would encourage you all to continue to make that case to your uh, elected counterparts at the county level and see if maybe your your tactics have more fruit than ours have had. Okay. 
Okay. I would say that my meetings at the county level don't always go as well as they should. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Additional questions? Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, board. And it's uh, been a busy month in the administration department. Um, we spent a lot of time putting together our budget and strategic plan. We have been busy negotiating several collective bargaining agreements, uh, one of which is on the agenda for today. Others are going to be new ones for our organization. So we've had two new bargaining units that have elected to form this year. That being our part-time firefighters have all elected to form a bargaining unit and our police clerks. And so we've been uh, busy working through those issues and we will continue to work on those and hopefully have contracts with those bargaining units probably sometime in Q1 of 2023. So um, that's been what's taking up a lot of admins time and uh, want to again give shout out and kudos to the amazing response that we had from our police department uh, related to the incident at Pleasant Run. Um, could not be more impressed with how quickly we had an officer on the scene. Um, thanks to our partnership with the school, we had an officer that was already at the school and that, that speaks volumes to, to our ability to get there and address any issue should it have been the real deal. We've really taken this to heart and have, um, in addition to some pre-planned trainings with the school district, we've, we've furthered our relationship with them in terms of how we would collectively respond to any of these incidents should they occur and we want to be as prepared as we can be so that we make sure that we're ready to address potential pitfalls that may arise if this were to happen in our community. And with that, I will conclude my administrative report. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't know trustee reports. Okay. okay. I just want to tell, um, I look forward to serving uh, Thursday, all those who have served our country. So this is a belated happy Veterans Day. I also had the opportunity to go to the Hamilton County Municipal League meeting on Saturday with our state representatives and learned a lot. Um, it was nice to hear that our main goal here at Coleraine Township being safety is the main goal of our state representative. The police and fire were the most uh, talked about um, commodities we have and uh, we're all on the same page. One thing I do have to shout out to Chief Walls that we don't have a lot of problems that other townships have with retaining our firefighters. So we do have a much nicer retention um, employees within a lot of other townships. Um, and also talking to the state representative, we are going to come upon the rental registration again. Um, I think we are going to get some help from the state uh, representatives to help push uh, some more of this through. They'd like this more on a state wide versus a township wide. So we're working hard on that. And that's all I got. On oh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody next week since we're not gonna have a meeting. Oh, that's right. Yes. You want me or you? Okay, um, just a couple of brief things. Um, uh, tomorrow uh, is the solid waste meeting. Um, uh, a lot of fun that usually is, um, and I can give updates on that. And Those are I, live and they can be watched because I watched your uh, last one. It yes, they can, oh, wow. they, yeah. Um, and your name pops up when, well, when you're watching it on the, because uh, it's Skype or I don't know, MySpace or something like that, I don't know. Um, thank you to all the folks that voted. Um, I had an opportunity to work the, the polls uh, after I got out of school, and, and thanks to all that volunteered. Um, I will say, um, regardless of, of political affiliation, I sit back and I watch some of the states right now, and I'm just really proud the way Ohio handles elections. We are way bigger than some of the states that are still counting and counting and counting. Um, and uh, one of the things that hit me uh, it, listening to uh, Secretary of State LaRose explain this, and, and it's just so simple is that when, so we have 30 days of early voting with absentee ballots, and typically uh, the way that works is uh, once, once it goes into the Board of Elections, they have a Democrat and a Republican that open it up, uh, they match the signature, they smooth it out so that it's ready to go through the machine, and at 731 when the Secretary of State gets the order, all the early voting is run. And that way we have a huge data dump around 8, 815 or so, um, and that's the stuff that people are still counting two weeks later. And it's just like the answer to this is just so simple. Uh, and the other thing that struck me is we're lucky in Ohio 
is that um, in a lot of places, this is uh, like maybe a clerk of court that does it or a county clerk, and that's going to be, you know, a, a, a Democrat or Republican, and they're going to typically hire a Democrat staff or Republican staff. Here in Ohio, it's even the door lock, if you talk to Frank LaRose, it has two keys, a Democrat and a Republican key to get into the door, and you both have to turn in them at the same time. And I'm just so thankful that, that we're in the, you know, sometimes I'm a little spoiled. I'm like, oh, it's midnight and I don't know yet. My gosh, Arizona, it's going to be two years and they're not going to know. I mean, we're get the, I think they're getting ready for the next election. Uh, so thank you to, to all those that were involved in that process. Um, the, um, and, and just to piggyback what I said earlier, look, this is everybody's responsibility. It's drivers. It's people on the street. We are having way too many fatalities happen with pedestrians, and it's, 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 really, it's really stealing a lot of our young talent from us uh, as we continue to see this happen over and over again. Um, I also had a long discussion uh, with, with a state rep about, the, the, about some of the issues that we have with rental registrations. Um, and um, this is something that the state's on board with. And I had a, uh, in a discussion I had with Mr. McElroy, I said, hey, wh where are some of, as a board, where are some of our uh, kind of uh, weak spots? And he said, uh, you could show a bigger, uh, a bigger um, uh, influence in, in Columbus. And I've taken that to heart, and I'm driving them nuts. So um, trying to push some of the stuff. And not that I didn't before, but I'm kind of trying to elevate that to another level. Um, last couple weeks, I, I cut about 300 grand off the budget. Um, I think some items, uh, and I've taken a long look at this budget too. I, I do, I, I am very sympathetic to the idea that um, we need to spend less and we need to figure out better ways. Um, so that um, I, I, I know that this took weeks and weeks and weeks, but I might be back to you for some more uh, uh, to try to get some more, squeeze some more money out of it. Um, and you guys are going to get me the information on the uh, estimate of how much we will have left over, I guess. Um, happy Thanksgiving. And um, as I typically say this time of year, it's Steelers Week. Um. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. the, um, I recently received a question about cardboard recycling. And we have a uh, longstanding person in the township that generates more cardboard than can fit in their recycling and, and that's more of a question for, I guess, you're, you are our diplomat to Rumpke, and I will follow up with you on that question. We don't get a chance to talk to each other outside of meetings, so I wanted to uh, bring that up now. If you have an excess of recycling materials every week, what do you do with those? Yeah, I, well, you can hold on to it for the following week and hope that you have less, or uh, one option is you can take it to the, the Rumpke Recycling Center, or you can contact Rumpke to see about paying right. for an additional cart. Right, and I just wanted to bring it up for the general public to hear that answer. Uh, there was a question about why are we building fire stations now and why are we doing a lot of different things. Um, when we ran the last fire levy a couple years ago, uh, Chief Cook took us around and, and, and told, talked about the needs of the department and and the, it seems that the fire department had come up with about a six and a half mil levy. Well, the, at, at that time, the board uh, decided that the capital would be pushed off and we went with a three mil operating levy and, and maybe some capital funds would come in down the road. And in fact, what, what restarted the discussion was the, the COVID relief money. And it, it sounds like we're going to spend part of that on replacing a, a fire engine, which was part of that capital want from, from two years ago. And, and so the, the reason that's happening now in 2022 is just a confluence of all those different things happening and, and now, now's when they're getting built. So I'm, I'm fine with that. I did attend the Citizens Fire Academy graduation on October 26th and congratulations to everyone who went through the program, educating the public about fire safety. Uh, you, you never know when one little thing you picked up in those classes might, might help somebody. Um, very recently, I've, I've driven some streets in the township that the maintenance, the one-year maintenance bonds are coming off of, and that would be Copper Creek and Magnolia Woods, and uh, the, the off streets that come off Magnolia Woods, and, and uh, my position on the, the quality of those streets is the same as it was when we uh, voted no on accepting them a few years ago, but I have detailed some of the defects. Uh, while I was down on Magnolia Woods, I looked at the Dean Family Cemetery, and it's... Uh, 
uh, Chris Henson has, has gone a long way with, with her group with uh, negotiating with the builder, and there is a uh, fence up to separate out a walkway to get back there, and I did get back there, and I can look up at the top of that rise, and I can still see a scattering of stones, so there's obviously still some work to do, but I did get back there to look at it. Uh, one of the budget items that, that the board uh, voted on at our last meeting, and you saw it in the presentation on the, the public works budget in the road program, is our budget is typically about 1.9 million a year. The board voted to add one-time increase of $2 million. So for, for next year, it goes from 1.9 to 3.9 million. And that's just to try to get us a little bit moved up on our road program. And as soon as the Public Works Department presents the, and I hope hopefully that comes out in December at our next meeting, and I know you're busy right now with the American Public Works certification, but we need to get that out to bid and it'll just be a bigger package for 23, and it's my hope that we will do the 23 streets that were scheduled and move a lot, if not all, of the 24 streets to 23, so we at least uh, get ahead on the, on the program a little bit. Um, I got a complaint about the corner of March and Lapland. To those of you that live in the Lapland subdivision, please quit blowing through the stop sign. We talked about putting one of our rolling stop $154 signs there and, and uh, just so that that resident knows that I've looked into that uh, we talked about please um, don't cook in your garages and don't use gas grills and and deep fryers in your garage it's not designed for that there's no ventilation and it's uh, apparently brought the attention of, of several neighbors to what's going on there and the, the last thing I would say is um, we have an Eagle Scout in the community, Robert Harris, and I was uh, contacted by his his father, and I'm, I'm hoping we can have a little proclamation at the next meeting that I'll try to get on the agenda just to recognize this young man's achievements. And, um, and uh, thank you, Matt. All right, All right. Uh, thank you. Um, moving on now um, to new business, public safety. Yes, the first three items in public safety will be presented by Fire Chief Alan Walls. Welcome back, Chief. Good evening and thank you. Uh, first item, we have a motion to authorize the Township Administrator to, an exe to execute an agreement and related documents in substantially the same form with Pepper Construction to serve as the construction manager at risk for the construction of fire stations 26 and 102. And we are recommending adoption of that motion. I would motion we authorize the township administrator to execute an agreement and related documents in substantially the same form with Pepper Construction to serve as the construction manager at risk for the construction of Fire Station 26 and Fire and Fire Station 102. I'll second. All right. Any discussion? <clears throat> yes, I have looked over the three proposals and, and thank you for presenting them. And I've, I've had an opportunity to discuss with Mr. Weckbach um, my questions. Um, and thank you to the, it's no easy thing to put together these proposals and, and thank you to all three contractors who participated and, um, and, and I, I think we're gonna uh, do fine with the contractor that your committee has, has selected. Thank you. Can um, we in our discussion, can we um, tell the public why we chose Pepper, one of the? Sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there were really two things that stood out to uh, uh, Please turn on your mic, sir. It's an important thing to do. So there were, there were two things that really stood out to us throughout our staff interviews and review of the presentations from the three firms uh, that made us want to select Pepper. So first was their attention to quality. Uh, I think almost every other word that I heard them say was coming back to the word quality. And, and we grilled them pretty hard on what they meant by that and how they've had to actually pay up when they've made mistakes that weren't up to the pepper quality. So that, that meant a lot to us. The other piece actually had to come down to some of their uh, pre-construction services and how they align processes. So a lot of times when you're in these situations, you go through the process of vetting subcontractors and those subs get brought on board. They're told, hey, I'm the bricklayer. These are where I'm going to lay the bricks. And that's about it. What pepper actually does is they force all their subs to come to one meeting at the same time to make sure that when we say we're building, say, a window in the wall that looks like this, you've got the bricklayer there, 
you've got the glass installer there and you've maybe got whomever is sealing the building there at the same time so that at that moment everybody hears what the expectation is so that there's no uh, there's not as much of an opportunity after the fact to come back and say well it's not my fault that it's a drafty window i'm just the glass guy that's on the bricklayer or that's on the you know whoever did the final seal on the building so that was something that was kind of unique about their approach from a pre-construction standpoint that really stood out to us as well and, and told us that they were probably the best fit for us out of yeah. this project. And thirdly was our budget amount versus two feet. Yeah, so one of the things about the, the Pepper budget, so when we were reviewing all of these, uh, it's construction manager at risk, which means that we're typically going to come to an agreed upon guaranteed maximum price that guaranteed maximum price for these facilities is going to, I think according to the, the tentative schedule happen in either March or April of 2023. When that does, what that basically sets is the ceiling for how much the township is going to pay on the project. In some of the proposals, uh, you'll notice that there is not any dollars and cents that they're willing to offer back should the number come in under. So if we come to say $9.6 million at the end of the day, that's what they're gonna get paid regardless of what the work was. Peppers actually commits to refunding 100% of any of the dollars that are not spent. So if we come in at $9 million as opposed to $9.6, Township would get $600,000 back in savings. And if I may as well, there was a scoring matrix that was put together um, for all of us involved in the interviews to individually score um, those construction managers. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe all of us individually um, scored pepper number one yes that is correct okay i think it's good for the public to hear that then all three of these bids to estimate the cost at 9.6 million dollars so all three bids came in at the same amount and I, th I think any one of these three companies would do a fine job uh, you've done a lot more homework on it than 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 the trustees have and you've been through all the interviews so i'm fine going with mm -hmm. the uh, company that's recommended yeah, and I um, I did double check. They did do some work at Outer, and that checked out. They're legit. So, oh, okay, now we're <laughs> set. Yeah, um, no, I did. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Unger. Um, all three of these have uh, very good reputations, um, and you know, when it comes to uh, something like, uh, you know, you may not be able to guess this, but I've never built a fire station, uh, so I want to defer to the people that that are the experts on it, and. Um, and I appreciate all the hard work that went into selecting these folks. So I'm going to support what, you know, what, what your recommendation is. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. And it seems to be time to call a vote. We're going to, wow, it's 930 and we're finally going to have a vote. Okay. Ms. Orich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wolf? Yes. That passes 3-0. So um, we will execute an agreement related documents uh, with Pepper Construction to serve as construction manager at risk for Fire Station 26 and 102. I assume with the assistance of legal counsel every step of the way. All right, Chief, you have an item B here. I do. Uh, this is a motion authorizing the Township Administrator to execute contracts with, with ZHCX for $44,000 for commissioning services for Fire Station 26 and 102, and we are recommending adoption of the motion. I recommend we approve the motion authorizing the Township Administrator to execute contracts with ZHCX for $44,000 for commissioning services for Fire Station 26 and 102. I'll second. All right, discussion please. Now this is, again, per discussion, this is this company is going to test every system. All the mechanical, electrical, All and plumbing systems. So just to let the public know what Correct. this is entailing, every electrical, plumbing, every system. Okay. Yes. No other comments from me? So how, how would this differ, uh, for those that might be wondering, how would this differ from a owner's representative then that, that uh, okays something when they take delivery? Yep, so they've got the very specialized skill set, tools, and abilities to dig in on this. The owner's rep or project manager, which will be the next vote, is intended to be our on-site, day-to-day construction manager for the project. So they're the ones that are going to be out there that are fighting on our behalf to make sure that everything that they are seeing is up to the standard that we set as the township and what our goal for the project is. There will be the folks that are in the meetings when we come to say a budget issue because there will be a budget issue somewhere along the lines, whether it's the lights came in too expensive or the tile for the bathroom came in too expensive. And they'll be there to hopefully help mediate and 
come to the decision that still meets the goals of our um, project and keeping us within our overall budget. So uh, difference being one is focused solely on the testing of, of those the equipment. systems at the end. Yes. All right. Any other questions or discussion? I'm guessing that $44,000 is part of the soft cost that you have built into the budget. Yes, that was built into the budget. Mr. Pick? Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. Um, for the Township Administrator to execute contracts with ZHCX for commissioning services for Fire Station 26102 for $44,000. Uh, Chief, uh, item C. Item C here. We have a motion authorizing the Township Administrator to execute an agreement with Omer Shaw Group, LLC, to serve as the owner's representative project manager for the construction of Fire Station 26 and 102. And once again, we are recommending adoption of the motion. Uh, and that will be between $50,000 and $77,600. I recommend that we approve the motion authorizing the Township Administrator to execute an agreement with the Omer Shaw Group Limited Liability Corporation to serve as the owner's representative project manager for the construction of Fire Station 26 and 102. A second. All right, any discussion? I think it's critical that we have an outside third party look over all these things, and including the, the commissioning of services. This will just be somebody that is representing our interest. And as Mr. Weckbach described, when perhaps a certain material that was spec is just not available, um, it would go through this person to you know make sure it was an approvable substitution or to negotiate any, any problems that we would have along the way. So. So uh, when, it, when it comes to this, I, I kind of jotted this down. I, three different questions I want to ask is um, uh, when it comes to these expenditures, how would it add to the basic function of government? Um, and, and to me, this would be something that would maximize what we get for our money. Um, how will it make us more efficient as a government? And I think that, uh, um, that, that having somebody that knows the lay of the land uh, with this construction would make it more efficient. And what, all the, what are the alternatives? And we've discussed the alternatives, uh, and, and that would be taking someone from your office to taking them away from that. And they're a firefighter. They're not a, they're not a contractor. Um, and we're getting somebody to specialize in this. And for that, for that reason, I intend to support that. Uh, Mr. Baker. Ms. Orich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. An agreement with Omar Shaw Group LLC to, for the owner's rep for construction 26102. I would like to thank the board, uh, the administration, and our residents for their commitment and support. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right, the next three items are out of our police department. Just saw a bunch of your guys pull out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's all the flashing blue. Yep. Chief? Evening, again. All right, uh, item D, we have the uh, resolution declaring nuisance and ordering abatement. This resolution allow for the removal of uncontrolled <coughs> vegetation and or refuge at the following properties. 2400 Adams Road, 12104 Birch Grove Court, 9871 Capstan Drive, 3241 Crest Road, 12166 Glen Crest Court, 107 I'm sorry, yeah, 10794 Invicta Circle, 9936 Laura Linda Drive, 3227 Niagara Street, 2449 Roosevelt Avenue, 2520 Springdale Road, 2795 Springdale Road, 3475 Springdale Road, and 11448 Swiss Vale Court. Recommend adoption of this resolution. If we could just hold us, um, this is a 380 page I document. My, my, and I can't seem to find the page. Page 203. Okay. I don't think I scroll that fast. Hold on. Yeah. And once again, the comment about the Blitz in Northbrook, would you say over 50% of these are on or near in Northbrook? Yeah, I, I would say that that's the safe assumption is majority of the issues that we have yeah, are in trouble in mind that. load tonight, mm -hmm. too. Because of because it's Steelers it, week. It, it, oh. might, it might come in easier on my iPhone rather yeah. than this screen. I'm almost there, sorry. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, because you're thinking you're supporting something. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because we've got yeah. Yeah. the scope of services. And... Yeah. Oh, hey, I found it. Okay, so um, I apologize for that, Chief. So do we have a, a motion with regard to the resolution declaring nuisance and ordering abatement at the addresses provided in the packet? I motion that we approve the resolution at the addresses um, detailed by Chief Cordy. I'll second. All right, any discussion? None. Keep it up. All right, Mr. Baker. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Ms. Stronger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3 0, uh, ordering abatement at those addresses. Um, next item, Chief. Item E, resolution declaring a junk litter vehicle at 2733 Roosevelt Avenue. Uh, recommend adoption of the motion to declare an order abatement for a junk motor vehicle at the following property, 2733 Roosevelt Avenue. Uh, it is a 1999 white Ford F-150 with Ohio plates of John Henry George J-H-G-9334. Again, recommend adoption. I recommend we approve the resolution as described by Chief Cordy. I second. So we have a, uh, a motion and a duly recognized second. Uh, any discussion? None. All right, Ms. Mr. Rich. Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3 0. Um, public services, we're going to have a follow up discussion, which we kind of already. I think we have one more. Uh, did I miss one? Oh, yes. Um, Sweatcherhoff, yes. Sorry, I'm, I apologize. One more. Item F Resolution declaring a junk motor vehicle at 6666 Schweitzerhoff Road. Uh, this motion is to declare an order abatement of a junk motor vehicle at the following property, 6666 Schweitzerhof Road. It is a 2003 Blue Subaru Outback, Ohio plate of Henry Paul Union 77, HPU 7070. Recommend adoption of the resolution. I recommend we adopt the resolution declaring a junk motor vehicle at 6666 Schweitzerhof Road. I second. All right, any discussion? None from me. Yeah, the, ad the address is kind of... It's an extra. Yeah, know, there's, yeah an there's an extra, yeah. Um, Mr. Baker. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wallace? Yes, that passes 3-0, uh, ordering a, 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 declaring a junk motor vehicle on Schweitzerhof Road. Uh, thank you, Chief. Now we'll go to um, some public works. Yes, public thank service. you, Board. So, as mentioned, uh, this is intended to be follow-up discussion and clarification on our end regarding the traffic calming that you all voted on at the last meeting. Since then, we've gone back, talked to staff in the Public Services Department. Uh, Menominee, in particular, is a concrete-based road with a layer of asphalt on top. What that oftentimes means is that we will see some buckling in the road based on where those concrete joints are. Uh, if we move forward with asphalt traffic calming devices, there's a good chance that there will be buckling on those devices and potentially potholes that form on those devices, just giving the specs of how large these devices are. Um, certainly in talking to staff, the recommendation from members of their department would be if we went with a similar product to what we did on Niagara, that that seems to be a solution that would work and be effective in this scenario as well, especially because if we do have some of the buckling that occurs at those joints, we'd be able to lift up those devices get under, repair the subsurface or the surface as we need to, and then put the device back in and reinstall it. Um, in their mind, that would allow for greater uh, you know, longevity of the roadway if we went that approach. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have spoken with one of the residents that was leading the charge on this initiative in my conversations with her. She's on board with that approach as well. Um, so just wanted to share that with you all uh, in case that helps your decision making. So walk me through this um, with the ones that we have in the quote unquote temporary, which yes. we're not using them for the intended use, but that's fine. Uh, do they get spiked down into the road? They do. So there are hundreds of holes that get drilled into the road for to, to sort of keep it in its place. So how, how, how wide is a spike? I, I want to say they're, they're maybe like Three quarter inch. Yeah. Does that fill? Can water get in there? Um, because it cover it's covered by the actual speed. So, so there's always a chance for water penetration anytime you make a hole in the road. That's where our belief is by having the epoxy surface that goes on over top of that will help to seal it better and prevent more water from getting in. That was my question. If there's some kind of mediation we can make to. Yeah. Even if it's not really an accepted mediation, but something that we so can... So that's the number one distinction that we did not do with the first go-around, because when we installed them, we thought they were going to be temporary, yeah. not permanent. So, 
we can make that distinction if we decide to go that route. And I'm, and I'm fine with using the same ones we used um, that have been down for a year or two years now. Okay. Do you need a resolution for that, or can you just take the consensus of the board? Or I don't. If the consensus of the board is that you all are fine with that. I agree with Mr. Unger. Okay. One of the things about a composite street, which is a street with c concrete control joints and with an asphalt overlay, is that concrete moves differently than the asphalt and the, the joints tend to reflect up through the asphalt surface and that's what you're talking about by buckling, which are, yep. what's actually happening is the base of the street is moving and that's why you see that, yes. that crack come up. One of my comments earlier during my trustee report is that's not the situation out on, on Magnolia Woods and we just have whole pavement sections that are moving out there. And, but I understand that I'm Menominee so I'm fine using the devices that we've installed on other streets, so. Perfect. I will share that information with the. Uh, yeah, okay with that too. Sure. So you heard from the department for their bid from three of us, and yep. and it sounds like that's the thing. So. Perfect. Thank you, board. Um, B. Next item is a motion to issue a request for proposals for Colerain Avenue bus station pull off So, this was funded through SORTA, as mentioned previously in the budget presentation. Uh, we have until February of 2023 to start spending the, the dollars as it relates to this project. So this would actually install the first set of two sets of bus station pull-offs. Uh, these would be located uh, near Northgate Mall. Uh, not sure the exact location just yet because we are going through right-of-way acquisition. But uh, this would get the RFP out through our Bid Express system and through that system we would then be able to solicit quotes and hopefully have a contractor for approval at the January Board of Trustee meeting with expenses incurred before February 2023. I motion that we issue a request for proposals for Coleraine Avenue bus station pool offs or this is for all of them or one of them? This would be for two of the four, the two okay. northern ones. Okay. An RFP for two of the four. I motion that we issue a request for proposals. I'll second. All right, any discussion? Um, who did the ones in front of White Oak Shopping Center? Are we, because they, those are, that really turned out nice. Yeah, I'm not sure who did. I can reach out to Green Township okay. to see who they used. Um, from a design standpoint, I can sure, do the same. because I think it's nice. That it, it, it just, the flow of traffic is so much better there now since yes. they've did that. Tremendously better. Right, so I can see that happening really nicely at Northgate Mall. Yes. So this, I'm going to get way down in minutia here. Yes, sir. Um, on the utilities, um, I guess I didn't realize this. One of the utilities it, it, it listed is BP Oil. Is there a, is there a pipeline that goes under there? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. It runs through Ross. Well, they get when you call under underground utility marking, they will mark for they will yeah. provide a list of the companies they are marking for. Yes. Right. And they have a, it right here. Yeah. Yes, there is a a BP Oil pipeline not too far from where we're at okay i did not know that thank you so don't dig without calling oops first right mm, yeah you don't want to hit that thing it's no. under it's a very high pressure line all right uh, mr. mr baker Ms. Ulrich. yes mr unger yes mr waller yes that ps is three zero uh that the, the, that we wish you request for proposals for corn avenue bus pull-offs yes the final item out of public services is a motion authorizing the township administrator to execute an agreement with MI Homes for snow and ice removal of the Abbey Town subdivision. So typically when streets are under construction and homes are under construction, the developers will reach out to us to see if we will plow the streets on their behalf. Uh, the standard going rate for townships is anywhere from five cents to 10 cents per lineal foot. Uh, when Abbey Town reached out, we offered a rate of 10 cents per lineal foot per snow removal, which would amount to about $300 each time we have to remove snow. Our plows will be in that area at the time, so it's not necessarily going to be like we're going out of our way to do this. And so my recommendation would be to adopt the motion. I recommend we, ad I motion that we adopt a motion authorizing the township administrator to execute an agreement with MI Homes for snow and ice removal at Abbey Town subdivision. I second. All right, any discussion? None. None. All right, uh, Mr. Baker. Ms. Ulrich. Yes. Mr. Unger. Yes. Mr. Waller. Yes, that passes 3-0. Uh, that authorizes the township administration to execute agreement with MI Homes for snow and ice removal for Abbey Town. Mr. Miller. development. All right. Uh, 
All right, third time's a charm. This is a motion uh, recommending passage of a resolution that's adopting rental registration and rental unit maintenance standards. So we had uh, first reading discussion. We went back to Boardman Township who has been through this process uh, over a very long period of time with passage, litigation, uh, victory, and then uh, adoption and they have been in it three years uh, brought back their results uh, with your questions uh, answered as well and so this version uh, now incorporates your recommendations from the last meeting uh, I will note uh, for the viewing audience that the uh, version that you're voting on uh, is uh, slightly modified from what was uh, provided on the web and, and to you on uh, Friday uh, after consultation with our law director made a couple of typos. Uh, we corrected those and then there was one section on penalties that was duplicative and we removed it. So uh, those are the only changes from what you were provided on Friday and I gave you uh, all a copy uh, earlier today. All right, and any motions at this time? Any motions? Yeah, I'll motion to uh, uh, adopt a resolution adopting rental registration and rental unit maintenance standards. I second this. All right, discussion. So the, the changes that you made, there's, it's not anything substantial. It just said in there twice that there was a fee to pay and you, right. you took right. that out. Right, in the penalty section, there were three sections and then we removed one of those. How will we know that this is a successful program? Uh, great question, and I think it's gonna be uh, a challenge for us you know, from the beginning to ensure that we have the most uh, extensive list to begin with as we go out and, uh, and notify uh, owners of properties that are being used for rental purposes. Uh, I think that the be that beginning list uh, and then the registration from that I think will tell us one thing uh, I was encouraged that Boardman Township had a 95 percent uh, registration uh, success rate and so uh, I think that going beyond just the registration uh, since that's not our goal because uh, the second part of this is rental unit maintenance standards and so our expectation would be that the standards would be higher they would they would be raised because of this process and we're providing an option for tenants to be able to uh, have a mechanism to file complaints to ask for township assistance in investigating uh, standards that are not being met by their landlords and so I think that would be a way to measure in uh, the, the calls that we get for investigations. There was a resident that did ask if this rental registration could be done online. Have we looked into online versus being mailed out? Well, your the initial one is everybody's gonna have to be mailed out. Yeah, clearly, I, I think the option would, uh, would be to do as much online as possible to- Save on uh, postage. Yeah, yeah to, to make it more efficient. Uh, eventually, you know, it's gonna take some um, hours of hands-on work to be able to uh, work through those that aren't complying. So uh, I think we're open to you know every opportunity, and that's from from now until June 1st when it would launch. We'll be able to put together uh, the SOPs on how that will play out in, in its most efficient way. You know, I, I guess m maybe let me make sure I'm thinking in the right direction here. Um, I think that this is a moving target, that it might need amending, it might need changed. Um, you know, we have a new uh, uh, a county clerk uh, uh, coming in, um, or a, uh, yeah, county clerk. Otter, county, county Otter, 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 sorry. Um, we, the clerk stayed the same. Yeah. Uh, we have a new auditor coming in. Um, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, I, I don't know what I don't know. And they're knowns, known, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And we don't know how this is going to look with us. 
Um, and, and I think that it's, it's going to need um, hands-on, it's going to need patience, and it's going to need a lot of, um, a, a lot of checking to, making, to make sure that what the policy does, the impact of the policy is what we intend, and there's no unintended consequences. Um, and, and I look for it to become something to raise all, all, the, all boats, uh, the raise level. So I, I appreciate it. I know you guys have done a ton of work on this, and we keep sending you back to the drawing board. And, and, and I think at some point you just have to, you just have to go with it, and then, um, and, and then you have to revise and redo uh, when things maybe don't happen the way we think they're going to happen. There is a specific requirement in the resolution that we revisit uh, in three years. Uh, we may choose to do it before then because yeah. we okay. have found something that works better. Uh, I think we are starting with a good product by virtue of the fact that we have uh, copied much of Boardman Township's right. resolution. And we are modeling ourselves after them because it uh, is working well there. Mm -hmm. and, and so Coleraine is not necessarily going to be Boardman. And so uh, we'll, we'll be able to pivot and... I, but I we're not the only municipality. C city of Cincinnati is doing this. North College Hill has I know, been but doing township, it. I know, township. I know township versus yeah. city. That's where the, our problems for the public are coming in. Cities and villages and have different requirements in the township. So that's what, what why it's taking so long. <clears throat> and you know, this is not. Most landlords are very good people that take care of their properties, and this is sort of bubbled up from. This has evolved from uh, some landlords that are not such good stewards of their, their properties. And I'm, I'm just thinking of one right now that's a person that lives in Los Angeles and has a rental house um, over on Pool Road and is just not around to take care of it. And this will give us a, a little bit of uh, strength to help deal with problems like that particular landlord. You probably know which house I'm talking about. Yes, and and to get back to the question on feedback, as as the good bureaucrats that we like to be, um, we can certainly plan to have, you know, a structured presentation. You know, maybe six months into the program, three months in, a year in, that will force us to continue to evaluate the program and its effectiveness. And maybe after the first year, you know, that would be a good point for us to have that meeting because we'll be starting to gear up for budget season. And so if the program is not effective, we can either make changes or decide to scrap it. Because if we're not doing something well and someone else is, then I'm a big proponent of let's stop doing it if it's not working. And, and I go back to something. So I was involved with uh, when, when Cheryl Long was the city manager of North College Hill putting ours together. And I go back, uh, Mr. Solman was there. He reviewed it, um, I believe. No, yeah. no, it was um, Dieters, that's right. Um, but I go back to something that Char Charles Tassel said to me, and he was the head of the rental, uh, Northern Kentucky Greater Cincinnati Rental uh, Group. And he said, look, um, the, the, be the people that are doing the right thing, they do, even though they're landlords, they're going to support you in this because they don't want to be lumped in with the others. They want, they want this to be a better product because, you know, uh, they have to compete with the people that are cutting corners here, and they want it to be an equal playing field. Um, and, and that always just kind of stuck with me is, is that, uh, you know, most people wanted to, Dan brought that up, most people want to do the right thing, but we'll just give them a little push. I have no, no other comments. All right. Look. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wallace? Yes. That passes 3-0. Uh, we now have a resolution, and uh, we'll have to continue to monitor that. Administration? Yes, board. The first item tonight is a presentation of our budget book. This is really just an opportunity for you all, if you have feedback at this point or specific questions, to provide those questions or feedback. Uh, individually, you all are all also welcome to share any information or questions that you have with me after the fact, and I will try to provide you with as many answers as I can as we work toward our appropriations resolution for December. So with that, I will just turn it over to you all for any discussion you may have. Uh, I, I think it, I, I talked about this. Or the numbers scare me in this, um, in, in, uh, with the state of the economy. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more and see what else. I, I mean, it just, sure. I'm scared. Yep. And, and um, I am sensitive to the fact that whew, we're spending a lot of money. I get that. Um, and, and I think that we need to make sure that, you know, 
that, that we're being a good steward. Yep. And and part of the big reason why we're spending a lot of money is we're putting a lot of money into capital improvements, yep. which is a goal of the board is right. to invest, invest in our infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I think I think we will see long term benefits from these decisions. And I, I don't foresee the township from a fiduciary standpoint being on, say, the fiscal cliff to use a federal term or, or, or what have you. Um, so I, I do believe that we've got we do have some issues in our police department, and that's being levy, levy driven and the nature of levies. Outside of that, within the next couple of years, I don't foresee any other issues that we're going to need to address. Our fire department levy should last the five years, if not more, just depending on how dollars shake out, um, which was the commitment we made when we went to the voters for that. So, And I believe that, uh, at least in the seat I'm sitting in, to, to, to put off the fire stations longer would just be uh, – that would just be imprudent to do that those need to be done it's not and if we're going to wait for the perfect time they'll never get done yep. and part of our main goal is to keep the township our, our safety for our police and fire and 75 percent of our budget our revenue is for our police and fire correct uh roughly and the number one goal that you all adopted was focus on public safety right and so i think Budget and to some of the comments that residents have made, uh, specifically around pay, uh, the fire department CBA, we were able to come to terms with them uh, in a structured tiered approach that sort of phases in over several years, but gets them to the competitive place that they need to be at. And we're, we're working through and we'll be having contract negotiations with the FOP uh, because their contract is up next year as well. So it, uh, we will continue to work those issues as we can. And I am a 1,000 percent advocate of, um, I think that, you know, the crime, the crime data showing that it's an issue and that we're not going to have it here. And that's, you know, police, fire, uh, police, fire and roads, the uh, three, three main goals. And we're going to have impact units on the streets and we're not going to we're not going to put up with what other areas are putting up with. Agreed. We, we, could, we agree on stuff. Sometimes yeah, Matt, uh, I know. The fire station thing, that's, that's been a process, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, it sure has. Yep, yeah, but we're, here we are. We went yeah. ahead and approved the building to him. I, I could tell a little smile on Chief Wall's face when he left. I think he's been waiting a career for that to happen, so. Chief Walls is always smiling. He's out there in the hall. He's talking to Having some business with a couple of residents out there. Yep. So the irony is I think everybody that comes to this meeting and goes in this room has got the best interest uh, in the township at heart. It, they just have different different uh, visions on how to get that way. And we should be able to talk these things over. I get it. And yes. nobody nobody loses more sleep over these things than I do. I mean, it's um, when, when we were when I were talking to the police and the number of police we were having, I was dreaming about Coleraine police. And I'm like, holy cow, I, this is it's, it's a significant issue. So um, thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Unger. Thank you, Ms. Ulrich. All right. You want to go to ask me? Yes. So the next item is a motion authorizing the township administrator to execute a collective bargaining agreement with AFSME for public services employees. So we spent a couple months negotiating with the different individuals in our public services department that are represented by AFSME. Attached is the contract uh, that we've come to uh, with that group, and I would recommend adoption of the motion. I motion that we authorize the township administrator to execute a collective bargaining agreement with AFSCME for public services employees. I second. Discussion. And, and upon the, if this is approved, then you go ahead and file it with the state. Yes, sir. So it's so anybody would be able to read it on their website. I've looked at that website before, yep. so um, no other comments. Just a big thank you for um, negotiating this and for. You know, for everything public services uh, uh, does, um, you know, I, nobody gets rich working for the township. It has to be, uh, I, I, it, it's a, it's, you know, your, your heart has to be in it, and, and that matters for, from every employee. And I think that we have, I think that that's one thing we have in Corian. So I appreciate that. Yeah, this is your second union negotiation this year. Second of four. Uh, yeah. So there we go. You do work hard for that. Um, and, and to what Mr. Waller said, I mean, these employees do incredible work day in and day out, and they really shine during snow season. They right. are our crew. They're who keeps all of us safe and allows our first responders the ability to get to your home uh, to respond when you're needed or when you need us. And so 
Uh, they do some great work and are very much deserving of this contract. We need good employees. Mr. Baker. Okay. Ms. Orich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. Um, the uh, bargaining agreement with ASME. Yes, so board, the next item on the agenda is one that I'm particularly excited about. This is a resolution modifying our organizational chart and roster. So as you all are aware at, at this point in my tenure, I like to evaluate every single position anytime there's a vacancy that occurs. And as we were going through the process of identifying who the potential next assistant administrator would be for Colerain, uh, we came across two incredible candidates with very unique and complementary skill sets, and that would be uh, Tiffany Mays and Jeff McElravey. In reviewing our organizational chart and structure and sitting down with both individuals, uh, we were able to come to what we believe is the proper alignment of our resources and day-to-day -day operations. And so what this motion would do, or resolution, I should say, would create uh, sort of two assistant administrator positions. One would be the assistant administrator of operations and engagement, and the other would be the assistant administrator of finance and development. And so that would provide them both with very clear delineation of what their roles are, but I think it would allow us to have the right team in place to achieve all the visions that we set out in our strategic plan and continue to make this community as great as it can be. And so with that brief introduction, I will recommend adoption of the resolution. I motion we adopt the resolution modifying the organizational chart and roster. I second. All right, any discussion? Yes, and I would emphasize that this is not adding a, a person. One of these positions is replacing our former assistant administrator, now that you're the administrator, and the other one is Mr. McElreevy, who's just taking on a few more responsibilities with his position. That is correct. So, so this I, is not adding a person. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, that's fine, Mac. So, um, I, I think we came up to the additional cost to the township was less than five thousand dollars for this two-headed right. kind of, um, and, and I and I'm so happy that you've decided. I I, I know that you remember this because I bring it up to you every day, but when you first took that position as township administrator, I said, hey, I think it's a good opportunity to re reimagine what the assistant administrator does. I think I think two two assistant administrators would would make for. Um, a, a more efficient and, and uh, like a more direct kind of approach to things and, um, and and that's what we have and we have two very you'll see later when we talk discuss the candidates I couldn't be more excited about the candidates that we have here and um, thank you so much for uh, I don't know if you considered my my uh, recommendation of making it too but that's what happened so Maybe despite my recommendation. <laughs> I am an open book, and I consider all recommendations oh, as they good. move forward. So I didn't want to come to that meeting to decide, and then when we decided to do two, I said, how many times do you get the two super qualified people? We've had a job application for over a year out, and we have no qualified candidates, and we have two superior ones. So we are very fortunate with this yes. move. All right, Mr. Baker, let's vote on the modification of the organizational chart roster, please. Ms. Orich. Yes. Mr. Unger. Yes. Mr. Waller. Yes, that passes 3-0. We will um, uh, modify the org chart. Now we have a motion. Uh, author, well, I'll, let, I'll let you introduce sure. it. Sorry. So this is the motion to fill the first of those two positions, and that is to fill uh, by authorizing me to sign a contract with Jeff McElravey for an employment agreement to serve as our Assistant Administrator of Finance and Development. He would be eligible to assume this role starting on Monday, November 21st, and his annual compensation would be $110,011.20. And I would recommend adoption of the motion. A motion we authorized the township administrator to enter into an employment agreement with Jeff McElreevy. I second. Discussion? And like I said, we're not adding a person. Mm -hmm. This is just changing, adding some responsibilities to his job and adjusting his salary appropriately. And it's very hard to get somebody in this position and we're very fortunate that you're staying and taking on more for us. Thank you. I think that uh, um, Mr. Mac Mr. McElravey, McElravey, if I could say his name, is an immensely talented individual and I'm proud to have him here uh, and to continue to have him here. And, you know, he said, uh, we, we met once about something. He goes, I want to be able to look around the corner more to look at what's coming. And this, I think, puts you in a position 
to look around the corner so you can warn us of potential pitfalls coming. And um, I, 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 to be clear, I think you're just going to excel um, with, with that forecasting edition and that management edition. And I'm, I'm so happy that you've decided to uh, continue. Mr. Baker? Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Walton? Yes, that passes 3 0. Congrats, Mr. McElravey. Yes. I, I just realized this that it's going to be M&M, &M, <laughs> pending the next vote. I, I mean, I'm not going to assume a vote, but uh, the next item. <laughs> so, so we've potentially moved from three Jeffs to M&M. M&M, &M &M, &M. &M. yeah. Okay. Well, um, so the next item is a motion authorizing the administrator into, into an employment agreement with Tiffany Mays, and this would be for Tiffany to serve as the assistant administrator of operations and engagement for the township. Again, we went through an extensive search, and Tiffany has a great track record. Uh, she currently serves in, at Fairfield as their director of recreation. Uh, prior to that, she's worked at other communities in the greater Cincinnati area, and uh, her compensation would be set the same as Mr. McElravey, and she would also begin uh, working with us on November 21st, so next Monday. So uh, we would like to recommend adoption of that motion. In motion, we authorize the township administrator to enter into an employment agreement with Tiffany Mays. I second. Discussion. Super impressive resume. I look forward to all that you've done for Blue Ash Fairfield, that you can do it here. And once again, this is the backfill, the position that you vacated when you became administrator. And uh, uh, contingent on a positive vote, welcome. And um, I, I am very much impressed with Ms. Mays. Um, uh, you know, you get uh, resumes say something else, but I like looking in a candidate's eyes and, and getting um, uh, getting responses. And the thing that, that struck me uh, with 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 Tiffany was the just the the, the honesty in her answers. Um, you know, not even even if it's something you don't want to hear, it's she's going to be honest with you on it, and it's um, in her. Um, her uh, positivity is just infectious. I feel like, you know, she's going to have a whiteboard with a, like a, a positive saying each day <laughs> to get everybody started. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, that, and that said, I, I think it'll be important for Helen to, to detail that we're not adding a position here when you make this, um, when you uh, put together a press release about our new person. So, Dan, are you saying we're not adding a new position? Like the four, four times or five times? No, it's just I'm just thinking of I'm I'm thinking this through and thinking how this yeah. comes out to tomorrow. And you know, one of the reasons we have a communications director is uh, that that was born out of a lot of information right. getting out there on social media that that uh, you know the township's doing this or that, and that's why I'm. I teach 18 year olds. I know you have to repeat yourself multiple, multiple, multiple right. times but, in order but for Helen, it to. I'm sure Helen will do a good job uh, getting that out there. So. And I'm going to throw out a, a little known fact: uh, is she's a hockey referee. Yeah. Can I say that? Did I do what I just did? So that's tough, man. Yeah. That's what impressed him the most. Yeah, I'm like, wow. Oh my gosh. She can stand up to anyone, even Dan. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll have a vote, please. Ms. Orch. Yes. Mr. Unger. Yes. And Mr. Wall. Proudly, yes. Three zero. Uh, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, board, the next item uh, requ is required per the contracts that we just entered into with uh, Jeff and Tiffany that uh, we will auth author a resolution that will allow us to pick up a portion of their PERS that is paid by the township. Uh, so this would be 5%, which is outlined in the employment agreements that we contemplated, and I would recommend adoption of the resolution. A motion we ad adopt the resolution for the OPERS pickup for the assistant administrator positions. I second. All right. Any discussion? None. 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 Mr. Baker. Ms. Orch? Yes. Mr. Runger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes. 3-0. Um, we pick up Opers. All right. Item G. Yes. So this is the last item of new business, and this is a motion to authorize the administrator to enter into an agreement with Zix. So Zix is currently who we use in order to have our Microsoft Office 365. Uh, that contract, should this be approved, would run through October 2023. And I will recommend adoption of the motion. A motion we authorize the uh, township administrator to enter into a services agreement with Zix. I second. All right, discussion, please. 
And for the record, I neglected to state the dollar amount. Yes. It is twenty-two thousand seven hundred sixty dollars and seventy cents. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Approve this sign. Good to go. Mr. Baker. Ms. Orich. Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. We will uh, authorize administrator in agreement with Zix. Old business? No old business tonight. All right, we have um, uh, three consent items. Yes, so the three consent items before you are a donation to the fire department in the amount of $200 from an anonymous resident, a donation to the administration department from Meyer, and that is to support our annual employee awards luncheon, and finally, a new hire. This would be a part-time firefighter paramedic in fire and EMS. And that is Mr. Jay Shin, Jake D Laney, at a dollar amount of $16.41 per hour. And I would recommend approval of all consent items. I motion that we approve uh, consent items A, B, and C, which is all of them. I second. All right, any discussion? Yes, I, I have a, a comment. I guess this might be the time to make it. Uh, the, the previous item, the, the 22760 that is in the agenda if anybody wants to see the estimate. Okay. I just, Thank you. I've been following this on my phone because this uh, left, yep. this, uh, it, it, this probably it. needs to have a, a tech update, this just so does. you know. I have too many pages, yes. So, but my phone is, is oh. going right through this stuff, so that's why I had to look it up on the phone. You both might want, want to try turning it off and turning it back on. <laughs> well, the, the probably, it probably needs It's a, too many pages from all the reports. All right, um, uh, let's have a vote on, um, or do we have a second? Yes, we have a yes, second. A second. Uh, let's have a vote on the consent items. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wallace? Yes, those passed 3-0. Um, as I turn it over to the fiscal office report, I don't know if Mr. Baker will mention this, some good news from his office. Um, I'm so proud of, of, of the work you've done. Do you know what I'm talking about? 297? I, yeah. I do. I do. All right. You want to talk about that? Sure. Um, when I started here uh, three years ago, I never thought there would be a day where I could actually give this update. Um, but as of um, today, um, we have zero public records requests to fill. We have... <laughs> We, thank you, thank you. We have received year to date 297. Um, I, I hope I haven't jinxed us. I hope that uh, you have. It's like by, by yeah. the morning. We don't, but anyway, but I can I can give the report that uh, we have fulfilled all public records requests, and that is really a testament, I think, to uh, Glenna Carter and and Jeff Weckbach because I, I could have never uh, accomplished that on my own. And sure. Jeff Baker. Um, yeah. I'm just a, a part of it, but um, it's 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 a pretty impressive uh, feat um, that I'm I'm really proud of. Could so. you tell um, the public about how many Green Township record requests get a year? I'm glad you asked um, because I do uh, check in with them from from time to time just to gauge since we're very similar in uh, demographic and size, and uh, they uh, year to date have received 11. Uh, public records request 11 to 297. 297 yes we're way ahead but we we've uh it cost us a lots of money to do this so have, thank you uh, we have we have accomplished a lot and yes. I'm, I'm pretty i'm pretty proud of that you and, should be and, and lastly uh just to give a brief update i know that um mr uh McElravey did a great job of kind of giving you an overview of the budget for 2023 and i just want to give a little bit of an update uh, where we are uh, in 2022, um, because so, some of the news is, is pretty, most of the news is very good. Um, there are several funds that currently are projected over 100% of their budgeted revenue. Um, and most of these, um, police, fire, EMS, parks, I know that it's the year isn't over yet, but a lot of those are performing uh, year to date um, under budget for expenses. So if you're over budget on revenue and under budget on expenses, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Now, unless uh, this expense report turns out the way that the votes did cast in, in Nevada and Arizona, oh, no, 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 <laughs> um, no. we should be pretty good uh, going down the home stretch. But uh, uh, that's all I have. For it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Executive session. All right. Um, before uh, adjournment, I just want to point out um, 
um, the, since I've been here, um, this is probably the most fantastic collection of talent we've had as an administrative team. And um, um, I, I'm, a, I'm not putting pressure on you, but I think you guys are going to do great things. And um, welcome to Mr. McElravey, um, uh, um, uh, Ms. Mays. Um, it takes pressure to make diamonds. There you so go. We're prepared. Well, I tell people all the time, being my Adam first Rumbers, year, I have control. never had seen so many people that work so hard for this township. So you guys are getting your money's worth. Mr. Unger has a motion. A motion that we adjourn the meeting at 10, 19 p.m. Yeah. We're in the same day. I'll second. All right. Uh, Mr. Baker? Ms. Orch? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes. We are adjourned. It's actually 1020 now. <laughs>